Hello. Um, I'm so sorry, guys. It looks like that the Paradise sessions that I had coordinated, um, once actually one of those um, sessions started, then it ended um, this session, uh, which uh, I don't know now that what happens to those concurrent sessions. Um, I'm so, so sorry. It was, I think, my fault that I created all of these um, Zoom meetings. Yeah. I believe that actually when I make people as co-hosts, then uh, Jack. Um, yeah, maybe... sorry, Ali. I think there was some, something wrong with the meeting. It continuously to end itself. So maybe I think it's because I'm the co-host of both rooms. So maybe you can remove me from this meeting and then it might work. Yes, I'll do that. Um, so the other session has ended right now because you are here? Yeah, I think maybe every time you guys like can start a meeting or something, and it ends the other meeting. I'm not sure if you can remove me from this meeting. Uh, you are. You sh um, yes, I removed actually you as the co-host of this meeting. OK. Yeah, and then now I can try to go back to the other meeting and see if yes, it please. works. And then you guys can try if it's ending as well. Yeah, yes. thank you. Uh, it's, um, I'm so sorry. It was just my mistake. Oh, it's OK. Zoom is tricky. <laughs> Um, so, um, Agacha was able to finish his lecture or was it in the middle of his? Yeah, I, he wrapped up his presentation and he was actually answering a question, uh, but I think that's okay. Uh, we can move on with the next session. Maybe we can wait a couple of minutes just to see if others are going to join us and then we can start the session. Mm -hmm. Can you make me a co-host, Inas? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> you, I make you host. I made you host now. OK. I can share my screen. Do we have the first presenter here? Yeah, I'm in the room. OK, great. Okay, um, I think we can go ahead and start then so that we don't lose more time. <laughs> um, so the next presenter is Amarin Sirpani and uh, the title of his talk is Using Social Media for Mobile Travel Survey Recruitment. Um, so each presenter has about 20 minutes uh, to make their presentation and then this will be followed by a five minutes Q&A session. And I will let you know when you have two minutes left. Could you allow me to share my screen? Yes, I will make you a co-host. Oops, sorry. Okay, so I think I can share my screen now. Just two. Three. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending this uh, session. My name is Amarin Sirupanic. Um, I'll be presenting this work um, that we have been uh, doing at our city, University of Sydney, in collaboration with uh, a researcher from National uh, the National Re Renewable Energy Laboratory in the U.S. So this research is about using social media advertisement to recruit smartphone travel survey participants. Our paper is currently under review. And this work has me and uh, associates, Professor Taha Rashidi, Dr. Shankri Kanayana Rahman, uh, Professor Travis Waller, um, Associate Professor Miyat Sabiri, uh, Professor Vidya Dixit, and Dr. Divi Nair. So, um, Back in 2020, the early days of COVID in Australia, our team wanted to collect um, travel diaries of Australian resident, residents 
um, and to this is to develop uh, components of an activity-based model. And from our previous experience with this kind of data collection, uh, in 2018, uh, the total cost to collect 500 travel uh, diaries of Sydney residents was close to $45,000. And so we went back to these companies again in 2020, asked them for the same code, and it ended up being three times more expensive than what it previously was uh, with, with less appealing terms. They could not guarantee any completions. Uh, previously, they were guaranteed like 500 completions, right? Now, uh, right. Sorry, do I need to admit people? It shows here that I, you know, some people are trying to enter the room and I need to admit. I will uh, take care of that. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. So, um, so we thought to ourselves, you know, is there a cheaper way to do this? You know, we don't, we don't really have that, that much money to spend. So we went back to our whiteboards uh, to review our formulas, and. The total cost of a data collection of this type uh, is basically the cost of travel survey, uh, travel survey app and the recruitment costs. And, and we thought, well, with the smartphone travel survey app, you know, if we use an open source option, we can bring this close to zeros. But uh, as you can see here, I put a lot of addresses here because if you want to modify you know, the platform that you, you choose, then you have to pay the developer to do that for you. Um, so it's not actually zero if you need to change anything on that platform. Uh, but for recruitment, there are many ways that people have done uh, in many tactics that people have done for travel survey recruitments, just as uh, sending out, you know, mailing out the survey forms and hoping that people respond back or set up these boots in uh, public places with high foot traffic so people know about your study. Or using like you know medias to advertise your study, televisions, radio, newspapers, or send out electronic emails, or using social media advertisement. You know it can be just like simple posts on some you know famous pages, like the university page, so a lot of students can see that. Or you know the most interesting the interesting thing, the one that I found was this Kumamon. Uh, it's a mascot, a really famous mascot in in Japan. Um, so. Maruyama and his co-author, they credited this um, character for their successful travel survey recruitment. All right, now, and we thought that maybe the winning formula here is you know, to use social uh, open source app and social media advertisement. And the platform that we chose was Facebook for, for advertising. So the goal here is to find how much it would cost per completion. And the pros and cons of social media ads for smartphone travel survey recruitment, because we couldn't find any papers at that time uh, that, that you know, try to offer this kind of insights. And also, you know, representativeness of the sample, attitudes of the participants, so that we can better know, you know, the biases in the sample or who would be more willing to participate uh, in our future uh, data collection. And the last one was the which one was the most effective in incentive options that we can offer um, to people? All right. And these are our past and current experiences with this type of data collection. Um, we collected uh, travel diaries of essential workers during the start of COVID-19 in 2020 uh, across uh, Australian capa uh, capital cities. And then in 2021, we also collected, you know, some a top up of that, but now we focus us on uh, the general population uh, in Sydney during the second COVID lockdown. And right now we are collecting more data, but now it's both travel and time use diaries of 500 Chicago residents using the same approach that I'm about to present to you. So these are the ads that we use in both of our, both of our data collection in Australia. Uh, the, the three on the left, we use this to recruit essential workers. So you can see that the images, you know, they're quite relatable if you're a, an essential worker. Um, and the two on the right, uh, the one that we use uh, to recruit the general population uh, who lives in Sydney. Okay, now, since, since there were two data collection, we call the first one targeted recruitment because we, we try to recruit essential workers. You know, we try to target them um, using, you know, different um, 
criteria, like if they work in construction and extractions, work in healthcare, medical services, protective services, or their interest in registered nurse. Um, so that is an option on Facebook that you, on Facebook advertisement platform that, can, that you can choose. Um, you can target people based on their interests. And the other one was board recruitment. So we basically targeted this to anyone older than 18 or genders, regardless of their interest, you know, just Facebook users, any Facebook users uh, in, in within the 60 kilometers of uh, Sydney CBD. Now, so the diagram on the right here shows, you know, from uh, it shows a participant journey from the from the time that they saw our ads to the time that they get reward. So once people see our ads on Facebook, they click on it and they have to do um, a screening survey. And then if they agree to all the terms and conditions, they're gonna to proceed to install the app, answer uh, the user profile questionnaire, which basically uh, it's a demographic questionnaire. And then they have to use the app to collect their travel diaries for four days. That's the maximum we ask. Some of them collected less than, less than one day. Uh, some of them collected between one to four days and some of them four or more, right? And at the end of their data collection, whenever they want to quit, they need to answer this post experience questionnaire within the app uh, so that we know that, okay, they're, they're done with the data collection and we, we're going to reimburse them for their time accordingly. Um, so some key points here is that 51% of people click on our ads ended up installing um, the, the app in the bot recruitment uh, and two in three people completed their data collection. But for the, uh, the targeted recruitment, 30% who passed um, the, the screening survey installed the app, but only half of them completed uh, the survey. All right. um, so in the, in the targeted recruitment, we actually use a marketing consultant to help us set up you know, the initial um, advertisement because we didn't know anything, anything about Facebook advertisement. So it was better to learn from someone who know, uh, but then in the board recruitment, we did everything ourselves. So we could get these analytics from Facebook about our ads, you know, the performance of our ads. And the key point here is that cost per thousand reaches are quite similar across all age group of each uh, sex. And reach per link click was highest in the older age group for both sexes. Um, cost per link click, uh, has an upward trend with age for both sex. So the older, you know, the older the people are, the harder to recruit them basically. Well, not to recruit, but to attract their interest at this stage. All right, so in this study, we sort of, you know, tried to compare it between three different surveys that we did at our city. Um, we tried to compare our own recruitment, the, the surveys that we did at recruitment by ourselves with the one that we outsourced both the recruitment and the data collection to uh, external parties. Um, and all right, so, but all of them uh, within Australia, the data collection happened in Australia. Okay, so if we compare only the recruitment costs, um, the reason is that, um, the reason that I'm not uh, comparing the data collection cost because you know different platform might cost difference. So let's just ignore that and look only at the recruitment parts of 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 the uh, the studies. So recruitment cost per completion for the outsource survey where we didn't do any data uh, where a third party uh, did data collection and recruitment for us, it cost sixty one dollars Australian dollars per completion. But the one that we did the recruitment ourselves. You know, for the general population. So this is comparable to the outsource survey. It only costs us $23.1 per completion. So you see it's, it's one third of the cost of the outsource survey. Now, uh, it's also important to look at representativeness of our sample. Uh, we can see that the older age group are hard to recruit regardless of the methods, you know, both the outsource survey and the one that we recruited ourselves also have this problem. Uh, it could be because of, um, you know, smartphone travel survey is not quite appealing to older age group, maybe because of, you know, uh, technological literacy. Um, however, Facebook has a larger sampling frames, which means you can, you know, you can access, uh, you can show the ads to more number of people in older age group 
than in, in a panel survey, what available in the panel survey. Uh, and in the market research panel, the, potential, the percentage of recruited males uh, in all age group were less than the quota. So as you can see here, uh, they were they could only recruited you know uh, up to seventy percent in each age group, and none of them you know obviously filled up. And in terms of attitudes, this is a set of questions that we asked during the onboarding uh, of participants. Uh, we found that. Um, the credibility, credibility and purpose of the studies are really important you know, for, for people who choose to participate. And most of our participants were tech savvy and they were open to data sharing. And overall, you know, most of them say that they had a good experience with the study. Right, so with the incentive, we basically offer them red pill and blue pill. So we tested this A-B testing. Uh, in, at random, we offer five dollars per completed day to you know, a number of people, and twenty dollars per completion. So, which means they need to use the app for four days; otherwise, they won't get uh, the full twenty dollars. And we found that the five dollars option had twenty-two percent more clicks. Um, well, actually, we also offer another option, another option, which is we not we don't pay you at all. Can you do it for free? but we're not gonna discuss about that here. Um, as soon as it's, uh, its effectiveness became clear, um, all the ads that we were running from that point on were only the $5 per option because we want to increase the participation rate, uh, which would decrease the cost of recruitment as well. So in summary, we think, we think that participants prefer you know, the earn as they go uh, option more than the other option that's quite locked in. And these are the pros and cons of social media advertisement for smartphone travel survey. Um, we found that this, uh, this approach is cheaper than using a panel, uh, a panel from research, a market research company, and it allows audience targeting. Uh, as you can see here, um, this here, we targeted registered nurse, people who are interested in regist uh, registered nurse. Um, and we can see that there were close to half a million people that we can reach uh, with this criteria. And you know, this number here, estimated daily results, uh, number of reach, it also varies um, with the amount of budgets you have put, uh, you put in uh, per day. So the more you put, the more you can reach, uh, the more people you can reach. So it's, that's why it's, I say here, it's easy, easily scalable with the budget. And there are many ad optimization options that you can play with uh, to see which one works best for your um, study. However, Facebook advertise, advertising's policy is quite complicated. It's always changing. You know, sometimes they also, well, they remove uh, a few options in the targeting uh, criteria, which means that a study that you ran a year ago, you might not be able to run it again, you know, uh, this year because they removed those options. Um, and representativeness of the sample is also, you know, something that we need to control. Um, for example, applying a demographic quota, a spatial quota, so that you don't recruit too much or too many people in one demographic groups, and you can focus your budget on the ones that are quite hard to recruit, like you know the older age groups. And so this is another another attempt that we try to increase the participation rates. Uh, smartphone travel survey is known to you know, have a lot of issues. If the user is, does not set the settings correctly, like you know, allow the app to use location continuously, even then in the background, the phone cannot detect locations. So this is what we, we developed. We developed a real-time dashboard that can help um, the deployer to diagnose problems on the user's phone. And so that we can contact them, ask them about, you know, how the app is going, how the data collection is going and help them fix these issues. Uh, right. Um, and uh, in conclusion, we found that social media's uh, recruitment was one third cheaper than using a panel's uh, market research panel. And people before, uh, prefer uh, to the earn as they go option more than the lock-in option. At the end, we all, you know, if they completed four days of 
data collection, we pay the same rate, we, we pay the same amount, you know, but it's just the wording and the offer. Um, this is more appealing. And Facebook uh, ads review process can be quite inconsistent. Um, so we apply a demographic quota. So we could adjust the amount of money spent on different ads that targeted at different quotas. But we found that some of the age group, some of the ads that targeted uh, some age group got banned. Um, however, all the ads are the same, you know, just the age group that different. So that was something that surprised us. Um, so for future research, uh, we believe that the effectiveness and the cost to recruit spatially and demographically uh, representative sample uh, is, ha has been explored. So it's something that we would like to do in the future and you know, to experiment with different um, ad strategies to see how we can improve um, the result further using these different mechanisms that Facebook offer. Yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ermarin, for this interesting presentation. I don't see any questions on the chat box at the moment. Any questions for Ermarin? I have one. Um, so one of your conclusions is that people prefer the uh, earn as they go method. Yeah. Uh, based on what data, what statistical test results do you draw All these right. conclusions? So you basically, we were running, yeah. basically, we were running this similar A-B testing, uh, an A-B testing. So we saw that there were a lot more clicks in the $5 per day options compared to the $20 per completion. So, you know, with that result, we chose to run all our ads using the $5 per day. Uh, like I said, you know, the total cost of that would still be the same for us, but it creates a different, you know, result in terms of recruitment um, if we use the $5 daily earn as they go. But is this a significant uh, difference? Have you maybe tried some statistical tests and... Right. Um, is it significant enough? Because yep, um, you end up with a small sample size at the end, but I guess this is based on the initial clicks that you're yeah, getting. Yeah. It was only based on the number of clicks. Um, it was a suggestion. So we use Facebook to run it. So I believe they have some you know, machine learning or st statistical test for that. That's what they suggest us. Okay. So it's a feature that built in on Facebook. Hmm. But based on your final results, uh, yep. do you see a difference in the completion rate uh, for the two categories that you offered? Some people get the earn as they go approach, the other gets the full amount at the end, right? Do you see yeah. a difference in terms of the completion rate? I think like you pointed out, you know, the sample was quite small, so it, mm. we, didn't, we should run a statistical test because it wouldn't be inclusive anyway. Yeah, yeah. I Hey, uh, we have a question, Jesse. Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, and and I, I have to apologize for my question if you covered it in your presentation. I was having problems uh, connecting and I'm actually dialing in from the United States, but this topic was very interesting to me and I wanted to chime in um, and tune in. Um, how, uh, how did you do the weighting expansion on a non-probability sample, uh, a convenient sampling approach versus um, a probability sampling approach like an address-based sample? Um, so if, if I understand the, the, your question correctly, we did not do any sampling per se. Um, so we were using Facebook, right? Um, right? And we apply demographic quota, which means, you know, once we have enough people clicks on our link, that, and that link, you know, it's we know that if people click on that link, they comes from this demographic group. And, and did you it, confirm that demographic group once they came into it, just to confirm yeah. that the yeah. assumptions were correct? But yeah. but in terms of because um, with convenient sampling approaches, um, you don't know if their travel behaviors are different from a known probabil mm -hmm. probability mm -hmm. sampling approach. And so, like in the United States, we're, mm -hmm. we're having issues with response rates. Right. I mean, they're declining probably across the globe. Yep. And so we're looking at different ways of trying to recruit households to do this. And so 
we're still sticking with uh, address-based sampling approaches uh, from a statistical rigorousness of it, mm. of that approach, mm. um, because we, we have different data sources uh, of known demographic, socioeconomic uh, yeah. characteristics, and we can weight and expand the data. Mm. But with a convenient sample, um, we don't know if they're diff if they act differently or if they travel differently from other groups of known probability samples. So there, some plants have an issue with us um, using a convenience-based sampling approach mm -hmm. um, because you can't correct for any biases in your in your sampling. I see. Yeah, um, I, I think that, that is a, uh, you know, a topic that we haven't touched on. So okay. basically it was you know, purely recruitment. We did not really you know, test whether our sample would have like uh, the travel characteristics that's similar to a travel survey, uh, an official travel survey. So, okay. so you, you didn't you didn't wait for any um, uh, biases in your in your sample. Okay, no, I, I, I appreciate because, that because our sample is quite small as well as you can gotcha. see. Okay, so like, yeah, great. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for Amarin? Okay, if not. We can continue with the next presenter. <clears throat> so the next presenter is Elnaz Iranesat. She's a senior lecturer in the transport engineering group at UNSW. And the title of, talk, of her talk is Solo Pooling and Autonomous Ride Hailing Services in Australia and Influential Factors for Adoption. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Mehmet. I think I, I think... need to make you a co-host so that you can share your screen. Nice. Um, yes, I can share my screen now. Oops, sorry. Yes, just bear with me, sorry. <laughs> Good job. Okay, I hope that you can all see my screen. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, well, I have to um, apologize at first because I'm still dealing with COVID. So um, to be honest, I have a very severe headache right now, um, but I'm doing my best to, uh, to present this research and um, thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, so this research uh, is about um, studying the factors which influence the frequency of using ride hailing platforms in Australia and also investigating that what are some of the factors for pooled and um, autonomous ride hailing services in future. And um, uh, I would like to also acknowledge my co-author, Associate Professor Renuka Mohadivan. That's the research that I uh, started um, that in 2019, early 2019, uh, but then due to COVID, I didn't have a chance to present it. Um, so here I am <laughs> at the BTR conference, um, yeah, gave me the opportunity to, to present that. Um, the uh, result of this research has been published uh, last year and kudos to three peer reviewers of this paper that uh, with their critical review, uh, they improved the quality of the paper um, too much, uh, to be honest. And um, uh, okay, so let me start. Uh, I think that uh, right heading doesn't need introduction thanks to uh, platforms like DD, Uber and etc. Uh, what actually uh, motivated us to do this study was that at the time in 2019, uh, there were just a few studies, a survey based studies, uh, looking at the factors influencing the behaviors um, of using right heading platforms in US. And in Australia, there was no study. And when we started actually uh, complete, um, drafting the survey and uh, doing that study, then um, so many studies popped up. Uh, but uh, again, it was very, um, very nice to see the comparison between different regions. Um, so 
uh, in terms of the um, uh, factors that uh, impact the use of right heading, uh, I kind of summarized the literature review in this table. So um, several studies looked at different social demographic uh, characteristics such as age, education, employment, income, if um, you know the car ownership uh, would impact gender, household status, and uh, even like living area, um, and also trip purpose. And some of these studies were in consensus in terms of some of the social demographic characteristics. Uh, for instance, about age, um, all of these uh, studies that are listed in the first row, uh, they all um, reported that uh, younger adults are more inclined to use right telling, which is a very obvious uh, one. So, but then in terms of the other social demographic factors, there were a dichotomy in, in um, uh, literature. So for instance, um, in terms of employment status, some report, uh, some studies reported that full-time employees uh, use more right heading. some of the other studies reported self-employed individuals. Um, and in terms of the car ownership as well, um, the, a few studies reported, for instance, those who own a car, uh, they use also right heading as well. Uh, some others uh, reported that those who don't own a car, um, they're more likely to use um, right heading. So um, actually just looking at all of these, um, you know, dichotomy in, in the literature, then we, uh, we felt that uh, it all depends on the context and the region and the case study. Uh, so uh, perhaps um, uh, without that, it is still worth uh, doing that survey in Australia as well. Uh, in terms of uh, the question that why people use right heading, um, again, um, some of the reasons, for instance, parking was mentioned in the literature, search for parking in city was difficult, or uh, for instance, uh, those uh, trips to airports, um, that people didn't have to rely on um, airport parking. And um, so these were the motivations of uh, people using right heading, or for instance, not being able to drive due to alcohol uh, drinking or some of the metropolitan um, seniors that they may have lost the, their driving license or they have some medical conditions um, or they live alone, um, that these were mentioned as some of the reasons. And also some of the sentiments and attitudes, um, latent attitudes that also were studied in the literature. So uh, these are like the factors uh, for using right heading and also why people use right heading, but also another um, aspect that we wanted to um, look was the impacts of right heading on other transport modes. Uh, so, um, the, uh, for instance, some of the, these reasons um, um, I mentioned as like, um, I mean, the impact of um, right heading on other public transport modes uh, was mentioned, for instance, substitution of public transport um, that were uh, reported by some of these studies. Um, also, some of the other studies reported that uh, it, uh, right heading also have generated new trips um, in addition to substitution of public transport. And um, there were also some other studies that suggest that uh, right heading can complement public transport. Um, so I have also listed the study areas um, that you can see most of them are in US, Canada, and on the, the studies that um, reported complementing public transport also was in uh, Chile. So um, again, that was another aspect that we wanted to um, investigate if uh, there would be any, um, any different um, attitude in, in um, Australia. And um, the other um, aspect was that what are the factors that uh, people may impact people using pooled ride-hailing services. Uh, at the time in 
19 only New South Wales and Victoria only two states in Australia had pulled um, had introduced Uber pool and um, still uh, so many states in I mean the other states and territories in Australia doesn't um, have uh, Uber pool or the other type of pooled services of DD or the other type of ride hailing platform so it was another uh, research question and we looked at the literature um, so uh, there were um, some parameters that mentioned uh, that were important were, um, uh, influential factors in using pool services, for instance, those which are uh, already multimodal commuters and um, uh, they may also, they are more likely use ride hailing as well. Three purposes also was mentioned, for instance, commuting to PT, uh, to public transport station, um, and using um, the ride hailing as a, like a public transport feeder, uh, or for instance, uh, going to shopping and leisure trips were reported in some of these studies. Income, age, employment, ethnicity, so all of those social demographic factors again were reported in several studies. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, all of these studies that, you know, when actually we, we were also completing the survey in 2019, they also um, started to kind of uh, popping up. Uh, but then uh, the implication of these survey-based studies were limited to uh, like the majority uh, were limited in the US. So uh, we decided to undertake this study in Australia as well. And um, also, as I mentioned, in some of the states and territories, uh, say we don't have the pool services of these right heading. So it was again interesting to know um, uh, that what are the factors, as well as like autonomous vehicles and um, AV pool uh, services as well. So we um, uh, postulated five research uh, hypotheses and um, these are the alternative hypotheses. So we postulated that there will be uh, some um, differences among metropolitan and regional residents because uh, regional residents in Australia and Outback, um, the public transport coverage is not um, um, as much as like metropolitan areas and also um, like travel pattern and uh, behaviors and attitudes towards uh, these new technologies that you use and you should use mobile phone and etc. then uh, also is, um, um, would be different. Uh, so user preferences um, as well, we, we thought that it could be different and um, the attitudinal and social uh, economic factors underlying um, these motivations and preferences, um, we also postulated that could be different. Um, and to purpose, um, as well as the, um, the implications of right heading uh, with the substitute of public transport in both metropolitan and regional areas or just in um, regional areas, and et cetera. So these were some of the research hypotheses that based on that, then we um, um, constructed for main research questions. The first one, we looked at uh, the social demographic and um, behavioral factors influencing the frequency of ride hailing platforms. Um, and the second question, we looked at the pooled ride hailing services. And again, uh, if these determinants would be different in regional and metropolitan areas. And in the third question, then uh, we looked at the AV ride hailing services. And uh, the fourth one, uh, we also wanted to know that uh, if these factors or the attributes of right hailing would be different, um, would be valued differently uh, for different two purposes. Uh, so the methodology uh, that we decided uh, to, um, to take was uh, developing two separate uh, hybrid ordered logic model. Uh, with the latent variable model. So it was an um, integrated latent variable, um, hybrid latent variable model uh, and um, for, for the frequency. Um, and um, as I mentioned, like four models, uh, four separate models were developed, uh, one for frequency, one for pool services, one for autonomous ride hailing and one for pooled autonomous ride hailing services. Uh, 
Uh, the survey was a web-based survey in 2019. Uh, it was administered and um, uh, it was actually, it consists of sample of uh, 777 uh, Australian residents. And uh, we looked at both regional and metropolitan areas based on, and then we actually pulled the uh, respondents based on uh, the, um, uh, based on the uh, ABS, based on their age and uh, gender uh, representative um, of the whole population. So we looked at the census data of 2016, and based on that, then uh, the sample was chosen um, among uh, metropolitan and regional residents. Um, I, I, I actually uh, put one uh, choice task here because uh, the, um, the reason that I decided to present actually this research uh, was um, uh, basically the method, uh, the methodology that I used because uh, when uh, the survey was designed, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, as a, like a choice modeler, a traditional choice modeler, then uh, I would have liked to see um, a choice task with uh, a trade-off between different attributes of um, choice attributes um, and um, like several choice tasks. But then uh, this survey was a bit different and uh, I wasn't the main person at designing the survey, um, but um, it was interesting uh, to uh, to see that how we can still use the uh, the data collected through this survey um, and coming up with those research questions. So as you can see, uh, we actually uh, through that survey uh, we uh, captured. Uh, the ordered uh, likelihood of using um, these services. So it was an ordered. Um, uh, choice preference. And uh, then we also recorded it based on different three purposes, work related, uh, recreational shopping or trip to airport, or um, even like trip to a public transport um, terminal, for instance, a ferry or a rail um, or a cruise terminal as a like as a, um, a public transport feeder. And also, uh, again, another snapshot of the um, of the one of the, the questions, and uh, you can see that um, here the attribute of the um, of the choices uh, were also observed as ordered uh, in an ordered nature. So, for instance, uh, we asked the um, respondents to um, uh, to rank um, uh, how much delay uh, is important to them, or how much priority drop off. Um, or walking distance is important to them, uh, how uh, the price discount um, for different three purposes uh, would, would be important. So then um, the, the attributes were not actually the actual numbers, uh, were uh, um, captured just by an ordered nature. And uh, that was the first time that I myself um, just was looking at something like this and then um, just uh, thinking that how can I model it with a like a traditional choice model, a disk choice model. Uh, and um, I decided to take uh, to model the explanatory variable, the independent variable, also as a um, an additional model as an additional ordered profit model because of that um, ordered nature. So I couldn't uh, just plug in one, two, three as explanatory variable. I had to model the explanatory variable itself as another um, extra uh, model. Uh, I hope that I explained it <laughs> is clear. Uh, so that was something that uh, I thought it could be um, interesting and um, the as I mentioned we also looked at the latent uh, variables as well uh, so for instance for the frequency of use of rate right hailing um, there were exogenous variables social demographic and transport related variables for instance um, uh, what's the current public transport usage or vehicle ownership of people and then uh, we um, also captured some of the ordinal indicators related to technology, uh, to driving, uh, and to privacy um, attitudes um, 
and we consider three latent variables, tech-centric, anti-driving, and security-cautious people, and uh, we model the frequency of um, using ride-hailing um, that were observed in three uh, classes, hardly ever once every two or, or three months, and once or more in a month, and so we actually modeled it as an um, ordered logit model. Uh, for the pool services as well, uh, it was um, exactly the same thing, but then uh, the models uh, were again separate for different two purposes. And um, here we have another latent variable, extra latent variable, which was pooling favors. Some of the indicators that uh, we asked um, to understand um, was the people's attitudes towards uh, pooling and sharing a ride. And then uh, for the AV model, uh, then we had another extra, um, actually a, a separate latent variable for AV favor, um, uh, which was captured by different indicators. Um, so the result uh, of, um, I, I, I actually presented the result of the average treatment effect estimation. Um, and again, as uh, I mentioned, uh, kudos to those uh, three peer reviewers of this paper. Uh, it was actually recommended by one of the peer reviewers that we look at ATE uh, estimation as a very useful um, kind of alternative as uh, instead of simulation because uh, our small sample size, we couldn't really simulate um, we couldn't actually um, separate the data for modeling and for simulating. Uh, so uh, the average statement effect uh, basically tells us that if you replace um, a, um, a, a, a base a population, uh, for instance, 100 people uh, who are in the age of 18 and 30 years old with uh, another group of people who are um, between 30 and 50 years old, then uh, how much uh, would it change uh, the likelihood of using um, uh, these services or um, uh, would change actually the frequency of using ride hailing? For instance, this one is about uh, using the, um, the frequency of ride hailing. And uh, as we can see that, for instance, when you um, uh, replaced uh, these young people um, who are old, uh, younger than 30 years old with uh, another um, category of uh, people who are between 30 and 50, then uh, the likelihood of uh, the frequency of using right hailing uh, will, uh, will be reduced by um, um, 34%. Uh, and uh, so these are some of the results I, I, I try to, um, just to, for the sake of uh, time, um, uh, let me just get to uh, the text uh, format. At, um, you, have a, you have oh, one minute? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm trying to wrap <laughs> it up. Uh, so um, for instance, for regional residents being older than 70 years old compared to the less than 30 years old, would decrease the chance of sharing ride uh, with a package as well. So that was another um, research question that we wanted to know if they can share uh, a ride with a package of food or something like that. And um, so basically finding indicated the possible market for also AV ride hailing um, to be, to be uh, operating to or from terminals in metropolitan areas. And uh, perhaps it's because of the high parking cost in terminals or, um, um, uh, or that. Uh, and as also a possible intervention measure uh, to increase the adoption of pooled services uh, could be um, to, to drop the cost of the pool services uh, to older uh, individuals because um, as, as we, we learned that um, uh, comparing the, the, the uh, age range, the seniors older than 70 years old uh, in metropolitan areas are less likely to use pool services. So uh, some of the insights that we got from this research and then uh, we also looked at the travel choices in the absence of um, these ride-telling platforms. We, we asked the respondents that what would they do? Uh, and uh, we adopted the same uh, questions uh, on previous studies in US, uh, Alemi and et al, uh, to kind of to being able to actually compare these results. And then we also asked the impact of ride-telling on uh, travel 
behavior and other transport modes. And uh, bottom line was that right hailing can replace public transport with a higher percentage in metropolitan areas, while in the regional areas, the substitution of private cars occur with a higher percentage. And um, right hailing also has induced a more significant reduction in active mode uh, usage as well. And um, uh, there were also some other um, insights that I, I can actually wrap it up if I don't have time. Um, yes, um, but at the, okay, uh, so let me just um, say this, that right telling um, uh, companies that uh, wanted to promote full services uh, also should also focus on the walking distance to pick up points and um, devise also some incentives, uh, perhaps in the form of like loyalty point or something to encourage customers to utilize this service. Uh, with the AV uh, option, again, um, uh, we understood that uh, it could be a challenge, particularly in the metropolitan areas, uh, but then um, be uh, like Australian governments uh, can look at uh, that AV right hailing option as a complementary um, tool uh, for commuting trips to public transport stations. Uh, so perhaps some uh, campaign, educational campaigns could be useful uh, to increase the knowledge of people. Uh, there were some limitations, sample size, and um, um, the aesthetic preference nature of the sample. Um, and uh, yeah, so with that, I, I finish my presentation. Thank you very much, Eddie. Um, I have one quick question, which is probably about the slide that you see, Kip. Uh, so we know that ride hailing services, pooling services, they usually attract public transport users. So do you have any, any findings related to that from this study? Oh, yes. So as I, as I mentioned, uh, in the metropolitan areas, I think I mentioned it in the slides. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, basically, uh, um, the in the uh, metropolitan areas, a higher percentage, it replaced uh, PC, I mean, the uh, respondents, um, of this sample, uh, they, they reported that they replace public transport. Uh, in regional areas, the substitution um, occurred with private cars um, with higher percentage than public transport. So that's actually one of, one of the uh, challenges, and that's something that I think um, pu public transport agencies uh, should have a look at that um, uh, mobility as a service and uh, looking at all of these pla um, platform as an integrated uh, mode of transport. So if they can utilize uh, some of these ride hailing services for some of the uh, regional outback areas that there's not enough public transport frequency or coverage, and they bundle it uh, with the public transport, um, then they can kind of, uh, you know, seize the opportunity and then utilize that ride hailing as a complementary, as a feeder to public transport instead of creating another competitor. So that's something that, you know, is an opportunity for transit agencies to bundle these services together instead of just leaving, their, uh, leaving them on their own uh, so that they become a competitor and then uh, they just allure uh, the um, riders from public transport. It's, it would be a danger. Yes. I think we might have time for one quick question. Any questions for Ellie? Okay, if not, we can move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much, Ellie. Thank you. Okay, I think we're the next presenter is missing. So we'll continue with uh, Yao Yao soon. And the title of the presentation is Two Echelon Multi Period Location Routing Problem with Shared Transport Resource. Are you here, Yo Yo? Okay, probably not. I can't see his or her name in the participants list. Okay, in that case, I think 
we'll have to continue with the last presenter, Jinghua Liu. Uh, okay, I'm here. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, thanks so much. I will share my yes. uh, screen. Make you a co-host, just give me a minute. Okay, thanks. This should be working for you now. Uh, okay, okay. And the title of the talk is Analysis of Integrated Uses of Dockless Bike Sharing and Right Sourcing with Metros, a Case Study of Shanghai, China. Uh, could you yes, see my screen? screen? Yes. Oh, that's good. Mm, good morning. Uh, I'm Xinhua Liu from Tongji University. I'm honored to be here and have a chance to share my research with all of you. The title of my paper is Analyze of Integrated Uses of Dockless Spectroring and Resourcing with Metros, a case study of Shanghai, China. The outline of my talk as follows. The first part is introduction, the uh, second part is data and model, third part is uh, result and dis discussion. Uh, the final part is conclusions and uh, recom uh, recommendations. Uh, because metro uh, roads and station are fixed, a uh, general like our first and last mail connectivity is one of the main challenges for developing metro transit. To enhance their connectivity, uh, some major transit agencies are experimenting with uh, the inter, uh, with the integration of shared mobility modes, such as dockless back sharing, uh, that is DBS and uh, resourcing, in order to provide a uh, theoretical guidance for uh, these agencies. It is important to depend our knowledge of the differences between the integration of DBS and resourcing with measures. However, majority of studies uh, uh, separately examined the, the DBS and resourcing metro integrated use. To fill this gap, uh, we we'll try to compare the integrated uses of DBS and resourcing with metros. The metro transit system of Shanghai is one of the largest metro transit system uh, in the world. In Shanghai, over 50% of public transit trips in Shanghai uh, are completed by metro transit. In addition, resourcing uh, such as DD uh, development uh, repeatedly in Shanghai. Meanwhile, uh, DBS service providers such as Mobike also settled in Shanghai, making Shanghai the largest DBS city in the world. Therefore, we choose Shanghai as a study area. The data used in this study can be divided into the following five types. Uh, DBS trips, uh, resourcing uh, trips data, uh, metro uh, stations data, uh, POI data, and uh, GIS, uh, GIS layers. All this data were collected in um, 2016. Uh, our first objective was to identify integrated DBS and resourcing trips. In uh, integrated uh, DBS and resourcing trips can be examined in terms of three aspects. The first is connectivity. That is whether the trip is connected to the major station. The second is availability. That is whether uh, major transit is available at the start or end time of the trip. The third is uh, affordability. That is whether the connected metro station is the nearby station to the start or end position of the trip. 
Uh, here we draw the travel time and the distance distributions for no integrated use and integrated use. Both the travel time and the distance distribution of the integrated and no integrated trips um, differ significantly, indicating that the identification results are reliable. Uh, as shown in this table, we selected four types of independent variables that can be used to explain the dependent variables. As most integrated trips uh, are shorter than 2,000 meters, so we selected uh, 2,000 meters as the buffer to measure these uh, three types of independent variables. As our dependent variables were cut data, so we uh, applied negative um, binomial models to explore the factor influencing uh, integrated use. This method was widely used in travel behavior research. Figure shows the travel distance uh, distribution of DBS uh, uh, trips and resource and trips. Within the travel distance of 1.5 kilometers, the proportion of integrated DBS trips is higher than that of integrated resource and trips. Within the, when the distance exceeds uh, 1.5 kilometers, the situation is, uh, is uh, when the distance ex uh, exceeds 1.5 kilometers, we can see uh, the, uh, the situation is reversed, uh, which indicates that DBS and resourcing may provide short and long distance transfer service for uh, metro users. The, me uh, the, uh, the media uh, travel time of uh, access and egress uh, integrated DBS trips are uh, seven minutes. These values are slightly uh, higher than the median travel time of resource and trips. These results indicate that metro users can uh, usually reach the uh, metro station or their final destinations faster than using resource. In addition, we found uh, we found the uh, most travel time of, of metro users for both transfer modes are uh, within fourteen minutes. Uh, here is the tempo usage patterns. On weekdays, both integrated DBS trips and integrated restoration trips show clear morning peaks and morning peaks of integrated DBS trips are higher and easier uh, and uh, earlier than those of integrated resource and trips. This shows that metro us users prefer to use DBS to connect, to connect uh, with metro stations in the morning. Uh, on, uh, on weekdays, the number of egress integrated resources and trips um, don't show a sharp decline, uh, decline after uh, 6 p.m., but increase and uh, peak, peak and uh, 9 p.m., possibly because riders feel unsafe walking or cycling along after bus stop operating. Thus, riders uh, uh, select uh, uh, resourcing as a safer and more comfortable transfer mode. Average of the integrated uh, DBS is, main, uh, is mainly concent concentrated in the urban air on both weekdays and weekends. But the number of integrated resourcing trips 
is mainly concentrated in the suburban air. Another interesting finding here is that the farther away from the city center, the longer the integrated OD lines. Here is the result of negative binomial regression model. In terms of socioeconomic values, housing price has a significant positive impact on DBS um, metro integrated use, but no significant impact on resource metro uh, integrated use. Population density has no significant impact on DBS natural integrated use, but a significant negative impact on resource natural uh, integrated use. In addition, uh, the distance to the city center and uh, the number of bus stops around the uh, metro station have a significant negative impact on the DBS metro integrated use, but a significant positive impact on resource metro integrated use. Uh, in addition, uh, the land use mixture has a, a negative impact on the uh, two integrated uses. Uh, here is uh, uh, our conclusions um, from the results. Uh, the first is the travel distance uh, intervals with the highest proportions are 0 0.5 to uh, 1 kilometers for, for DBS and 1 to 1.5 kilometers for resourcing. In the temporal Dimension. On weekdays, morning peaks of, uh, of integrated DBS trips are higher and occur earlier than those of integrated resourcing trips. Unlike that for DBS trips, the number of egress uh, integrated resourcing trips didn't de um, decline uh, repeatedly after 6 p.m. Um, but uh, uh, increase in the date and peaked at uh, 7 p.m. on weekdays and uh, 9 p.m. on weekends. Uh, in the special dim um, dimension, uh, integrated DBS and resource trips are mainly concentrated in the uh, central urban air and uh, suburban air. Um, in addition, the built environment have uh, has different impacts on these two integrated uses. Finally, uh, the following policy suggestions are proposed. First is natural transit agencies uh, should uh, establish close partnership with shared mobility operators. The second one is uh, shared mobility uh, operators should uh, timely dispatch the fleet according to the uh, special temporal distribution uh, of the integrated use um, demand. The third is the transportation planning department should improve the built environment according to the transfer distance of each station to guide riders to choose better transfer mode. Uh, and this paper has published uh, in the Journal of Sustainable Cities and Society. And uh, uh, if you want to know more, uh, you can download this article and this web. Uh, that's all. Uh, thanks so much for your listening. Thank you very much, Inkoa, for this presentation. Any questions? I don't see any questions in the chat box, but if you have any questions, please raise your hand and unmute yourself. Hi, uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, 
two questions. The first, I, uh, I, I think I missed something. Um, could you tell me what, what is the difference between integrated and non-integrated systems? Uh, pardon? Uh, the difference of what? Uh, integrated and, and non-integrated trips. Okay. Uh, the in integrated trips is used to uh, connect it uh, with metro st station in this paper. No integrated trips is uh, just like uh, uh, um, such as uh, uh, completed with uh, public transit or uh, uh, complete uh, complete mutation. Yeah. Uh, Okay, I got it. I, thank you. And, and another question is about the DBS and the right sourcing. Uh, I, I saw the uh, I saw your results. The um the the, the density, the distribution density for these two uh kinds of travel modes are similar, but the right sourcing may have longer dis distance. But the, dis the distance is not not that long, about one kilometer to two kilometers, because it's kind of short for the right sourcing or, or right here. So I'm wondering, do you compare the frequency of use of these two modes? Because like for the density distribution seems similar, but I assume the rise also may be much, um, the, the frequency may be much lower than the DBS or not. Okay, thanks for your question. Uh, uh, I must apologize for my poor uh, English listening. Uh, uh, I want to uh, repeat this question. Uh, is is the the distance of resourcing uh, integrated trips is is short? You mean right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yes. So I'm wondering what is the frequency of use of these two modes? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, actually, uh, there are uh, nearly a uh, uh, seven percent of the total trips are used to integrate it, uh with metro transit, and uh, this is uh this number maybe uh maybe is higher uh uh in uh actual uh situation, but uh, in our paper uh we uh said a uh, a uh, very uh how to say yang. Uh, strip, uh, yeah. Uh, strip, yeah. Uh, so uh, this value is uh, lower, yeah. Uh, okay, I, got know, I, like, I got it. Thank six, you. Okay. I had a couple of questions too. Uh, so whether a trip is integrated or not, is this information given to you in the data set? Or is it something that you're inferring based on the characteristics of the trips? Mm, pardon, uh, could you uh, repeat your uh, question slowly? So whether slowly. a trip is integrated with a metro trip or not, is this information given to you in the data set? No, uh, actually uh, I uh, as I'm, uh, I develop a, a new uh, framework to identify the integrated use or not integrated use. Yeah. So you're basically estimating these integrated trips based on the characteristics, based on the destination station or something like that. Yes, yes. Uh, okay. uh, yes, yes. Okay. And can you also further elaborate on this negative binomial model that you have developed. Um, what exactly is the dependent variable there? Are you looking at the number of integrated trips in an area and you're trying to relate this to some socioeconomic characteristics in that area? Can you elaborate on that? Uh, you can share your screen again if it makes it easier for you. Okay, okay. Um, please wait a minute for me.
Uh, uh, your question is about our model, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, but I didn't uh, hear clearly, uh, please. Uh, so what is the dependent variable here? Uh, you mean what is a uh, people dependent uh, variable? What is it that oh, you oh, okay? Okay. Uh, the uh, the dependent variables uh, is uh, the is the number of the in integrated trips uh, in in this metro st station. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, here. Here. Here is a. Uh, here is a. Independent where uh, the, the dependent variables uh, at the special dimension. Yes. Here. And what is your conclusion based on this model that you develop? Do you see a significant difference between the two uh, trip types? Um, yes. Yes. Uh, there is a significant. Uh, Difference, um, as uh, as you say in this picture, uh, the DPS integrated trips is con uh, concentrated in the urban air. Uh, the in in uh, in the this uh, circle circle, uh, but uh, the resource integrated use is concentrated in the outside of this circle. Uh, that is uh, sub. Uh, Suburban air, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Thanks so thanks for your question. Yeah. Okay. Seems that no one has any other questions. Uh, is the missing presenter back in the room right now? Yo, yo, son. Probably not. Okay, we had two missing presenters in this session. Uh, I don't think any of them is in the room right now. Lei Yu and Yo Yo Sun. And uh, Mehmet, I checked, they also haven't shared their pre recorded video. So unfortunately, okay. we can't play anything. Okay. okay so we can uh, finish this session here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, uh, well, you can stay um, for, for the next one. I mean, uh, we can have a break. <laughs> yes, which will, the next session is going to start at 2 p.m., which is in 25 minutes. Uh, and you can use this Zoom link for transportation safety and accessibility session. And uh, there is another parallel se session, which is going to start at 2 p.m. That will be on emerging emerging research. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, uh, please stay on the Zoom link if, you're, uh, if you would like to attend the next session.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's Mushtaba Magrebi. Uh, um, from now till 4 p.m., hopefully, I will be moderating these sessions. And I'll hope that we'll have a, a fair connections. Then I'll have all the uh, presented on board. Uh, without having any way to go starting with the first presentations, uh, the title of the first presentation is Designing Electrical Vehicle Incentives to Meet Emissions Reduction Targets. And this paper has been um, uh, written by Yen Chu Wu and Electria Konoto. Konto. Um, um, really apologize if I pronounce incorrectly. Uh, Yen, if you're in the room at the moment, could you please raise your hand so that I can give you access to present your paper. Hi, can you hear me? This thing is yours and you can um, start the presentations. Can you all see my screen? We don't have your voice. Yen? Hi, can you hear me? We can't hear you. Okay. okay. Go ahead, please. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Yen Chu um, from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. This is a joint work with my advisor, Professor Conti. Today, I'm going to present our research titled Designing Electric Vehicle Incentives to Meet Emission Reduction Targets. Transportation is one of the primary energy consumers in the United States and the only sector depending almost exclusively on petroleum. The substitution of conventional gasoline vehicles with electric ones can reduce carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emission, depending on the source of electricity used for charging. However, due to the high, higher purchase prices of electric vehicles and comparable conventional vehicle products, the lack of dense charging infrastructure, as well as induced range anxiety, consumers have little intention to purchase electric vehicles. Our, re our research determines the policymakers' optimal incentives distribution over the planet horizon that increases electric vehicle penetration and enables meeting environmental externalities reduction costs for passenger transportation. We formulate an optimization problem to minimize the total cost of the electric vehicle investment program while achieving a desirable emission reduction goal over the set planning horizon. The proposed macroscopic policy framework will determine the optimal level of charging infrastructure and rebate investment. Our incentives optimization model is applied to a case study, which focuses on the United States vehicle, fuel and electricity market, and household travel. In our modeling framework, we have two sets of decision variables. The first set is RT, which are the rebates offered in year T. And the second set is UT, which denotes the number of charging stations built in year T. The objective function is set to minimize government's cumulative expenditure for the electric vehicle incentives allocation over the years. We calculate the expenditure as the rebate per vehicle times the number of electric vehicle purchased here, plus the charging infrastructure cost times the number of charging stations built in that year. We also consider the discount factor here. Here is the first set of first set of the constraint. We propose logistic functions that describe vehicle ownership demand. Besides the capital and operating cost, we include network externalities of the number of electric vehicle and the number of charging stations in the electric vehicle utility function. Network externalities capture neighborhood effects, 
For example, the probability of purchasing electric vehicle increases as the number of the electric vehicles adopted increase in a certain region. The total market size, which includes the market size of new vehicle registrations and the number of vehicle purchased L years ago that need to be replaced due to age retirement. We assume that everyone, every vehicle has a lifetime of L years that needs to be replaced after that. So the market size times ratio will be the uh, electric vehicle demand. And here is the gas demand. For electric vehicles, the operating cost is impacted by the need to use a backup gas vehicle in range limited days. The range limited days means that if the number of charging stations is not enough and if drivers need to travel for a long distance, they may not be able to complete the tour with the electric vehicle and they need to, need to for example, rent a gasoline vehicle. Thus, the electric vehicle cost includes the one using an electric vehicle and the one using backup gasoline vehicle. Know that DT is the average annual mile travel. D1 is the average distance travel with the battery charged at home. At home. And D2 is the annual enabled electrified miles by charging stations. We include a big M notation and a binary Y to ensure that D2 is positive and not greater than DT minus D1. D3 is the distance travel with backup gas vehicles. And this, this P of X is the probability density function of the daily vehicle mile travel. To calculate the annual uh, distance, the daily distance is multiplied by 312, as vehicles are assumed to be used on average 312 days per year. Here are the constraints related to the emissions reduction costs set by the policy maker. We calculate emissions as a function of distances traveled and the carbon emissions rate of, for both vehicle types. The, this is a constraint of uh, emission reduction target. The emission savings due to electric vehicle substituting gas ones over the set planning horizon needs to be greater than or equal to our exo exo exogenously set target. The proposed optimization model is highly nonlinear. We leverage and adapt a heuristic algorithm to solve the problem with, which is simulated in the algorithm. We apply our model to the national level case study, and we set a planning horizon of 30 years from 2021 to 2050. The do nothing scenario captures the minimum emission reductions to be achieved when the government does not incentivize electric vehicles. Given that, based on the budget model, a share of market will, a share of market will still choose electric vehicles. On the other hand, the maximum emission reduction would be reached if the annual rebate off. Alloc allocated is set to its upper limit, and the upper limit of installed charging stations is, is reached from the first year. We, pre we proceed with setting the emissions reduction target as 1.5 times the emissions reduction of the do-nothing do scenario. The, base case of, the result of the base case shows that all over the planning horizon, policymakers should invest in base earlier and charging infrastructure later. We base to be distributed earlier because the number of electric vehicles is cumulative. If more electric vehicles are adopted in earlier years, the penalty of the member externality term in the utility function will be smaller, and thus the utility will be greater. The discount factor should also be considered since we are trying to minimize the total expenditure and, and the, charging, the charging installation expenditure is lower if the charging stations are built later. We conduct several sensitivity analysis. We examine different emission reduction targets. We make upper bounds, levels of home charging, availability, fuel price outlooks, planning horizons, and traffic types. With different emission reduction targets, we conclude that the higher the emission reduction target, the longer the rebate per vehicle needs to be maintained at the upper bound. And the greater the final number of charging stations is. When we examine different rebate upper bounds, we observe that when the rebate upper bound is greater than 7,000, the cumulative number of charging stations does not vary significantly. But when it is smaller than 7,000, more charging stations are needed. This is due to the emissions reduction 
being accumulated over the years. And to reach the same target in the later years, more charging stations are needed to compensate for the low rebate values. Moreover, we examine different levels of home charging availability. When home charging availability is lower, the electrified distance is shorter. And the operational cost of drivers is high is higher since more backup gasoline fuels are needed to complete both distance trips annually. This will not only reduce people's willingness to choose electric vehicles, but also directly curb the emissions reduction. We use different outlook scenarios of fuel prices prices from EIA. We see that for the low oil prices that corresponds to the low gasoline prices case, drivers will tend to prefer gasoline vehicles, so higher rebates are and more charging stations are needed to incentivize the purchase of the electric vehicles. However, given that the difference differences in the prices in the prices in these scenarios are small, the resulting trends look small. To meet the same environmental quality target, having a longer uh, having a longer funding horizon to achieve these reduction targets requires lower rebates per vehicle and charging stations deployment. Last, we also tested three types of travelers based on their daily vehicle mile travel, modest, average, and frequent ones. For modest drivers, deploying charging stations is less effective because their travel distance is on average short and the demand for charging station is lower. On the contrary, charging infrastructure extends the electrified distance of frequent drivers, which can effectively reduce their operational costs. Therefore, rebates are more effective for modest drivers while charging stations should be prioritized for frequent drivers. To conclude, rebates are found to be more effective when provided, when provided in the early year years of the planning horizon because of the neighborhood effects that further incentivize electric vehicle adoption and due to the goal of minimizing the total expenditure. Charging stations could be installed later. We also conclude that the availability of home charging significantly is a system of emissions reduction target that can be achieved due to its impact on consumers' willingness to purchase electric vehicles and the enabled electrified travel distances. Rebates should be prioritized for modest travelers while charging infrastructure plays an important plays a more important role in accelerating the electric vehicle adoption of frequent drivers. Thank you for your attention. Please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, I have a, have one question for um, your research. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh. So. Um. Yeah. It's a very interesting topic, and I. Uh. I have seen a lot of studies on the like the the EV implication, the effect of EVs on the energy or on the GHG emissions and on the on the overall life cycle cost. Um, just have one question. Uh, did you calculate the upstream emissions from the electricity grid? Because as far as I know, uh, at the, the at the north part of the U.S., most of the electricity from coal uh, coal power plant. Uh, can you repeat your question again? I mean, uh, the part you said, uh, do, 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 I, yeah. do I calculate, do, do, I mean, include the, what emission? The upstream emissions from the electricity grid. Oh, no, I didn't do that. I uh, Here, I just, I, I do, a, this is a macroscopic analysis. So we just use the uh, data for like the whole national like the national level, so we didn't consider uh, okay. Of the oh, okay, so so it's like for the emission part, you just cut down the uh, the emission from previously from the gasoline. Uh, you just cut down this part of emission. Just assume the GHGs are, are disappeared. Is that correct? We we have the 
for the emission for the emission of electric vehicles, uh, electric electricity generation. Uh, yeah. Okay. That depends on. We consider the emission of uh, electric vehicles. Like th that depends on the source of electricity used for charging. Like it, right, the electricity right. comes from different energy source, and that will have like different emissions for that for electricity generation. And we consider oh, okay. that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm not hearing our moderator. Um, I'm not sure what he's up to. Are you still there? Mojtaba, we can't hear yeah, you. Yeah, I'm here. Um, Great. So you need to okay. take uh, control of the microphone in between these speakers. And the issues that I do have uh, after I share my screens, and because I'm not sure, because maybe I'm using the Mac version is not uh, there is some issues that I'm also helping from my uh, mobile phone to cover up the video, audio and the microphone if it doesn't work and now I'm, I'm using my mobile to uh, to use the mic microphone but uh, so sorry for that but uh, thank you so much Ian for your uh, presentations uh, so there's one more question in the chat box Should yeah there is a, the, yeah, there is a one question in a chat. Can you see that, or do I need to yeah. read it from free? I can, I can see that. Uh, someone asked me about like modest drivers don't need charging stations. Here, uh, this is the result of our uh, analysis. And for modest drivers, can you see that this is in? Uh, what happened to this? Figure is this true? I, I'm not saying that I I'm not saying that um modest tri drivers don't need charging stations. They need charging stations, but rebates will be more uh, effective for them because because if people have home charging, then for modest drivers they will, I, the mod the modest driver and frequent driver will be uh, classified here is based on their uh, travel, annual travel distances. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, is there any other question from the audiences? If, if someone I'll wanna answer, answer that in the chat box. Yeah, you've okay. only got 15 minutes for presenter and Q&A, so I don't think there's going to be much Q&A. You're going to have to move to your next speaker. Okay, go ahead. Thank you so much, Ian, for your presentations. We're heading to uh, the next presenter. Is the, the, the paper is the perceived accessibility of the public transport uh, predicts car ownership in, intentions, whereas objects accessibility does not and has been written by William Yoon, Leonard Lee, Miang Long, Z Cameron, Chan Lin Chen, Wen Wei Chun, and Kai Yuan Enji. I believe uh, uh, Kai going to present or any other persons from the, the list? Um, I'm, if, I'm presenting. Oh, you're presenting, okay. Go ahead, please. Um, can I have the right to share my screen? Yeah, if you feel, uh, raise your hands uh, in the, I can find your name properly and then give you access. When you, yep. Okay, since it's yours, go ahead, please. And you have a 15, uh, 10, uh, 15 minutes in total, 10 minutes for presentations and five minutes for Q&A. We've been uh, five minutes behind the schedule. If you could uh, manage your presentation within the time frame, we would be really appreciate. Thank you. Yeah, but I, I still can't share my screen somehow. 
I'll give you an access from the bottom. Uh, you can. Okay, now I see. Okay, cool. Go ahead, please. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this session. My name is Wei Lun, and I'm a second year PhD student with the Department of Marketing at the National University of Singapore. Today, I'll be talking about our paper that examines the impact of perceived accessibility of public transport on car ownership intentions as compared to the impact of objective accessibility. Before I begin, allow me to share a little about our research team. We are made up of researchers across different institutions in Singapore, like INSEAD, Nanyang Technological University, and the Land Transport Authority. So our team has several ongoing projects with the overarching aim of reducing car ownership. And this project, project that I'm presenting on is one of them. So to begin, there have been many definitions of accessibility, and one of the broadest definitions of accessibility in transportation is the ease of reaching different destinations. Our project focuses on public transport accessibility or the lack thereof, because inaccessibility of public transport has been found to be one of the biggest barriers that prevent car owners from giving up driving. To attract greater public transport ridership, Governments around the world have invested more than 1.4 trillion US dollars in expanding their public transport network. However, on top of investing so much resources, we think that it is as important to examine the effectiveness of all these expansions in discouraging car ownership. The first step then is to quantify the improvement in accessibility of public transport. So one type of measure that is commonly used by policymakers is network-based measures which takes into account different parameters of accessibility and is a relatively objective uh, measure. For example, the public transport accessibility level, in short known as PTEL, was first developed in London and is now commonly used in many different countries, including Singapore. PTEL is essentially a way of measuring the density of public transport network at any given location. PTEL, sorry. PTEL includes uh, a number of parameters like the duration taken to walk to various transportation nodes, the number of bus and train services uh, at the transportation nodes, as well as the number of bus stops, train stations near a given location. So this is a map that shows the distribution of PTEL scores across London. Areas with the reddish colors have better PTEL scores. And you can see that most of these places are located within inner London. So supporting the idea that better transport networks would reduce car ownership, only 42% of inner London households own the car as compared to 68% of outer London households. This also supports the validity of PTEL as a measure of accessibility. However, some researchers have begun to question how well this type of spatial network-based measures like PTEL could actually capture user, the experience of actual public transport users. Therefore, it is important that policymakers to, should start paying attention to the accessibility of public transport through the lens of commuters, also known as perceived accessibility. Perceived accessibility measures commuter satisfaction with public transport through survey questions like this one. It is easy to do my daily activities with public transport. And then participants would rate their agreement with this statement. The use of perceived accessibility as a valid measure has also received empirical support, given that researchers have found positive correlations between the perception of public transport accessibility and actual public transport usage. Now, given that both network-based and perceived accessibility of public transport have been shown to be related to transportation behavior, one may expect these measures to be correlated. However, in the only study known to us that specifically compared these two types of measures, the, researcher, the researchers actually found both types of measures to be uncorrelated. Moreover, the network-based measures and perceived accessibility also significantly differed across all regions of comparisons by the researchers. Hence, we think that more research is required in this area, 
especially in extending the comparison of network-based measures and perceived accessibility to the impact on car ownership. So we conducted two studies in Singapore. The first study compared PTEL with the perceived accessibility of going car-free, which includes accessibility afforded by public transport and other transportation modes like taking a taxi. The second study compares PTEL with perceived accessibility of public transport itself. In study one, we recruited car owners among employees of the Land Transport Authority. So this sample should be more aware of public transport development, and thus there should be greater congruence between their perceived and actual accessibility of public transport. Study two then is a nationally representative replication of study one, whereby regular Singaporean car owners were recruited. In both studies one and two, participants completed an online survey in which they provided their residential address, which we used to calculate their PTEL scores. They then completed the respective perceived accessibility scales and, and indicated their car ownership intention on a binary variable, with, with one representing having the intention to give up their car. Now, moving on to the results. Our results replicated past studies whereby PTEL and perceived accessibility were not correlated. More importantly, PTEL was also not correlated with car ownership intention in both studies one and study two, while perceived accessibility was. In study one, participants who perceived greater accessibility of going car free were more likely to give up owning a car. In study two, those who perceived public transport to be more accessible were more likely to give up owning a car. Then we also conducted a logistic regression, which predicted car ownership intention with PTEL and perceived accessibility simultaneously. The same patterns of results as the correlations were found. PTEL did not predict car ownership in both studies one and two, while perceived accessibility did. So a one unit increase in perceived accessibility of going car free in study one was associated with a 127% increase in the odds of drivers having the intention to give up their car. A one unit increase in perceived accessibility of public transport in study two was associated with a 52% increase in car owners' odds of intending to give up car ownership. Therefore, in this study, we found a dissociation between network-based measures of accessibility and commuters' perception of the public transport. More importantly, Commuters' perception significantly predicted car ownership intention while network-based measures did not. This suggests that policymakers should start paying greater attention to attitudinal measures like perceived accessibility, given that such measures have been rarely used in transport planning. The superiority of perceived accessibility is also consistent with previous research that highlighted the importance of consumer psychological processes in transport planning. So our, re our research team has developed two possible accounts that may explain the incongruency between network-based and perceived accessibility. The first is an information gap, whereby car drivers simply misperceive the accessibility of public transport in their vicinity. Car owners might have not taken public transport in a long while, and they are not aware of public transport network development. In Therefore, if such an information gap is the primary reason for the incongruence between network-based and perceived accessibility, then communication efforts that help car owners recognize the, en the enhancements in public transport should help fill this gap. The second possible explanation is motivated reasoning. Car owners who were reluctant to give up their car in the first place may conveniently perceive public transport to be less accessible to help them justify their continued driving. So we found support for this account in study one, but not in study two. Drivers who are more attached to their car emotionally tend to have a lower perceived accessibility of going car free, which was in turn associated with a lower intention to give up car ownership. So we call on further studies to further explore this motivated reasoning account. Finally, we would like to acknowledge some limitations of the present research. Firstly, PTEL does not take into account other aspects of accessibility like safety and travel distance, but inc only include parameters like walking time, wait time, 
and number of bus and train stations. However, even so, we note that these are important aspects of accessibility and yet PTEL was not correlated with car ownership intention nor with perceived accessibility. Lastly, we only studied the impact on self-reported car ownership intentions, which may differ from car owners' actual behaviors. So this is another aspect that we'd like to follow up on in the near future. And with that, this brings me to the end of my presentation, and I thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thank you for your presentations. Uh, uh, I'm looking at uh, the list if they have any persons who want to ask questions. Also, I have a very quick question from you. Sure. If there is no questions from the list. Okay. Uh, it was really good that you uh, checked that the how willing the people using the public transportation rather than their own uh, uh, tr uh, transportations facilities, but um, and it, mainly your research was uh, based on the data you gather, but uh, one thing that I didn't get, uh, now I wanna just ask you to elaborate more, is that uh, in the data you uh, collected, do you also consider the purpose of trip or if it was the general questions that you ask uh, from the, your participants? Oh, sure, thank you for your question. So if, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. So you are asking whether did we uh, differentiate between the different types of trips that uh, participants were making in our survey? Yes, somehow. And also um, mainly regarding the purpose of the trip. Is it work trip? That is the willingness is different or from the excursions or you know, entertainment trips? Yeah, so we, uh, we asked participants to, so in the survey, we asked participants about their typical uh, trip on a weekday. So this would include trips, uh, including the work trip or trips for other purposes, like picking up their children. So I believe this, uh, our survey includes the data on a variety of different trips for different purposes. Okay, cool. Uh, and also, if it would be highlighted, you would research would be really uh, much more informative. Thank you so much for your presentation. If there is any right. question from the list, it will be, we have a, a time for a very short uh, questions. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you so much uh, Thanks, for everyone. your presentations. We're very quickly move to the the next one uh, the next one is uh, the title of the paper is waste plastic as a binding materials in previous pavements blocks and is going to be presented by mahendra gimri i'm hoping that i'm not spelling i'm pronouncing your name incorrectly uh, if you raise your hand, I will give you an access to, to share your slide. Thank you. I am trying to share my screen. Go am I audible? Ahead. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. You can, I believe you have access now. Yes, sure. Okay. Uh, 10 minutes for presentation and five minutes for Q and A. Go ahead, please. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present the paper. My name is Mohindra Jimire from Trivon University, Nepal, Kupo College of Engineering. And I am pursuing for PhD in transportation and traffic in engineering. My topic is waste plastic as a binding material in previous payment blocks. Let's start the presentation. Just outline for my presentation is as First, I'm going to talk about introduction, objective, background, materials used, specimen preparation, testing of specimens, results and discussion, and I will talk about conclusion at last. Uh, first of all, introduction. Uh, this study deals on management of waste plastic as binding material in the manufacturing of pervious payment blocks. Uh, pervious payment blocks are open graded structure with interconnected weight that allows infiltration freely through pro uh, ports and it helps in reducing the runoff in uh, urban uh, areas. Uh, in this uh, type of concrete, there is absence of fine aggregate, uh, which helps to increase the void in the co uh, concrete. 
and the recycling is the best uh, innovation. So we are using this uh, plastic as a, uh, in our <coughs> concrete, uh, capable to carry the dynamic loading. These concretes uh, are capable of carrying the dynamic uh, loading. And in our uh, study, we have used plastic as binding material in place of the cement. Yes, now we are, <coughs> let's talk about the objective. Uh, the study helps uh, uh, to overcome the disposal of problem of plastic and it also uh, helps to control population of land, air and water. It ensures human, animal and animal safety. It helps in groundwater research, the block, and it helps in further helps in reducing the urban flooding. Background of the study. Plastic is a fast growing waste in this environment. So urban places are covered with impervious surface which lead uh, to urban flooding. And uh, this concrete uh, helps to uh, in, uh, <clears throat> helps to make recharge the water, so it leads to increase in groundwater table. Pervious pavements are effective way for this groundwater research. It can be used for lower traffic loads in solar sidewalks and parking areas. The compressive strength of the pervious block is normally lower than the concrete pavement, and the porosity of this block ranges from 15 to 35 percent. Materials uh, uh, in this study we have used SD AP plastic. Uh, these are high density polyethylene plastic and they are more wa water resistant capacity than other plastic. So we have used this plastic and the size of the aggregate use is 4.75 to 10 mm. The optimum <coughs> design, this uh, uh, size is optimum for the design of previous payment block in Nepal. It gives better strength compared to 10 to 20 mm and 4.75 to 20 mm. Uh, this is the material we I have used in the study, the sieve aggregate and the SDP plastic. Yes, SDP plastic with the uh, SDP plastic are these uh, small pieces of the water bottles, shampoo, bot shampoo bottles, etc. Yes, specific mean <coughs> preparation, preparation. There is no any specific standard for the mixed proportion for this type of concrete. The proportion of uh, sand varying from 50 to 80 percent by weight in plastic are adopted in the preparation of tile, and 60 percent proportion gives the best result. Proportions of plastic is varied from 15 to 30 percent by weight. The aggregate was heated up to 990 degrees Celsius. A recycled HDB plastic chips were added in aggregate and constant mixing was done. Uh, the, uh, while mixing the aggregate and the plastic, the temperature is reduced to about 160 degrees Celsius. The specimen is compacted in the mold of 15 into 15 into 15 centimeter uh, size. Total nine chips uh, were prepared for the study. Yes, the temperature is reduced up to 190 degrees Celsius. Of the aggregate, yes. So the aggregate and the plastic is mixed here after reaching the temperature. The cube prepared after the after bringing it out from the mold. Yes, testing of the specimen. The compressive strength and porosity of the cube are measured. Setting time of plastic is independent on temperature and decreasing rate of uh, casted specimen. It sets completely at room temperature. Curing is not required for this type of uh, uh, concrete. A compressive strength testing was done after a specimen reached at U -tem uh, room temperature. The, it is done by using UTM. Compressive strength test was carried out accordingly, and porosity is cal calculated simply by using the formula. Yes, the test uh, st compressive strength test is being done here. Yes, the gra you know, graph shows the, the bar graph shows the uh, porosity versus the per percentage of plastic as the percentage of the uh, plastic. Uh, increase the porosity has been decreased uh, first at 15 percent of the plastic values the uh, porosity was 22.25 percent and it decreases up to 12.11 uh, percent when the percentage of plastic is to 30 percent and the percentage of, and the strength of the concrete increases after increasing the percentage of the plastic it uh, increases from 2.03 a newton per mm square to 7.07 .07 newton per mm square when the percentage of plastic is 30 percent at the optimum percentage of plastic and the strength is uh, done by drawn from the graph is calculated from the graph and the optimum percentage of plastic uh, is 23.8 percent for the compressive strength uh, and 4.98 newton per mm square with optimum density <clears throat> optimum porosity 14.5 percent for the this type, this size aggregate 4.75 mm to 10 mm. Compressive strength of the plastic based uh, pervious concrete depends upon the aggregate size and the mixed proportion of aggregate and plastic by weight. 
size of aggregate used in the plastic best pervious condition mix has a relation with compressive strength. Smaller size aggregates show higher compressive strength compared to larger size aggregates due to dense packing of the aggregates. Larger size aggregates give higher porosity due to the presence of void. Increase in the percentage of plastic by weight increases the proper binding between the aggregates, but it decreases the void so it's, uh, <clears throat> and increases the compressive strength. Plastic based pervious concrete can be an ideal solution to recycle plastic and to control storm water, recharging the groundwater by proper management of recyclable HDP plastics. Thank you. This much for my presentation. Okay, thank you so much. Very quick. You, by yourself, allowing you catch up all of those times that we were behind the schedule. Uh, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I'm looking at the list if there is any persons uh, have any questions from uh, Maharanda. Could you please raise your hand? I do one very simple question is that uh, you mentioned that you're using the recyclable plastics gathered from the bottles and put yes. it in a, a concrete. Um, is just as a raw materials, you just share it in and then put it in a concrete and mix it with the aggregates. That's it. It was it was all the all, all the process or it was needs to be melted and then added to the to the concrete. No first uh, the aggregate was did up to 190 degrees Celsius and the plastic raw plastic plastics uh, were added uh, to the mixer and it uh, is again heated when up to the temperature that uh, the plastic and uh, the aggregate uh, mixed well to form a mold. First aggregate okay. was heated and then plastic was added and it was heated, uh, cooked. It was cooked until the mold can be prepared from the material. Okay, I appreciate. And also uh, my second quick question is that uh, also did you consider the uh, financial and economic aspects of your research? Because the plastic is the recyclable materials can be used in other purposes as well. If you use it in a concrete, what yes. is there any advantage in terms of the money wise? Yes, uh, we, I have not studied in this paper, but it can be, it is uh, more economical than the cement that can be used to make the concrete. And it is also the waste also can be minimized from this uh, study. Am I clear? Yeah, okay. Thank you so much for your uh, presentations. Uh, uh, okay, we very quickly move to the fourth papers. The title is Optimizing the Charging Plan and Fillet Size of Electrical Buses with the Energy Consumption Variations. This paper has been written by Yi Fei Su, Kui Zi Chen, Ai Jia Zhang Ran Tu. Tiju Li and Zhang Sun. I, I can see that Ran Tu is in the list. If Ran... Hi, you... yeah, I'm here now. Can, uh, can I be the co-host so like I can share my screen? You are now a co-host. Oh, got it. Uh, just wait a second. Okay, uh, can you see my screen now? Yep. Uh, okay. You, you can. Yep. Yeah. Right, so I'll start. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here in the VTR conference. Uh, I'm Ryan Chu, and I'll be presenting this paper from our, from our group. Uh, so just a little bit background introduction. Current in China, uh, trans, uh, trans electrification has almost been completed in major cities, but in the resource. Uh, allocation, the upgrading of the service and the bus replacement are still the issue for small cities. And also in large cities, we find uh, the re uh, resource utilization is very difficult because we purchased a lot of e-buses at the beginning of the electrification phase and those bus buses present, uh, present problems such as uh, short ranges, high charging cost, labor cost, and uh, depreciation cost. So here we aim to find general and apply to all recommendations for urban transit elect electrification. And this paper is the first stage of the project. Uh, this paper, uh, 
was done by the undergraduate students Ife and Chose at, at uh, Southeast uh, University. And in this paper, we optimized the charging pen and fleet size of literary buses with the energy consumption variations. Um, actually, this paper was done and accepted in the CRB this year, but due to travel restrictions, our group were not able to, do, to BDC to present at, at that time. So I'd like to, to thank the BTR com committee for providing these opportunities uh, for us so that we can share our findings with you. Okay, so this is a, a, the one a kind of introduction for the general question of the electric, electric, uh, electric buses scheduling problem. So in this type of pro problem, mostly we, uh, the objective is to minimize the total operation cost, including the vehicle purchasing and labor uh, cost, as well as the electricity cost from the recharging. And, and the constraints usually include the timetable from the scheduled uh, services of the bus operator, and also the route constraints as well as the recharging time window constraints. Uh, when we when we done the survey on bus operators and current literators, we find two uh, two factors that can affect the charging plan currently. The first one is from the energy consumption uncertainty, and this uncertainty may come from the driving conditions, the unvaried traffic conditions of the road, and also um, the, the vehicle specifications as a, as well as the road geometry. Also, the use of the air conditioning or other devices may also uh, may also influence the energy consumption variation of of the road. Round trip, and the second one is the nonlinear charging function of the uh, of this back of the battery. Because previously we always assume a linear uh, charging function, but in this way we may uh, underestimate the, the total charging time when the buses are in the charging. And then we, uh, in this study, we want to investigate the effect of the both aspect. And then we have our study here. Uh, here we compare the operation cost about different charging plans. We uh, we compare the charging plan that is, that is currently used in the uh, in practice that is uncoordinated charging plan. And also we we have another charging scenario that uh, that is called light charging. And this is uh, always proposed in current literature. And we also compare these two scenarios with the optimized charging plan we are pro uh, we proposed in this study. Uh, from the uh, from the comparison, we will identify the most cost uh, cost saving plans and the fleet size with the consideration of these two factors. We got our uh, data from the bus operator in um, the downtown uh, downtown uh, area of the Nanjing city. Uh, we collected data in six working days of this bus, uh, and um, we have the second by second speed, the location, the power demand, and the recharging state uh, for the two buses. And because we want to capture the uh, the energy consumption variations of the uh, of the round trip, so that we uh, we split the the, the daily uh, the daily operating period into three sub periods. That is morning peak, off peak, and evening peak. Uh, based on the departure interval of this bus. And here is this uh, uh, illustration of the energy variation of the round trip. As you can see here, the off peak actually have the similar uh, variations as compared to the morning peak. And what's surprising us is that off peak actually have a higher energy consumption Compared to the evening peak, and uh, we we look uh, we look into the, uh, the the data, and we find uh, that that maybe uh, due to the drivers may have more control on the uh, on their behavior during off peak because the traffic uh, the traffic con con uh, condition is good, so that the more uh, 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 aggressive driving behavior may appear in this period, so that the um, the, the energy consumption will be high. And to capture the, the, the uncertainty of the energy, we split uh, three different levels of the energy consumption that is high and medium and low based on three uh, period. And we will apply this energy consumption level into our optimization. And this is the nonlinear charging function. And we approximate this nonlinear charging function with a piecewise linear function. This is the um, optimization we propose. We we use a mixed integer linear programming uh, model to consider the nonlinear charging function, and we will solve it by an ALS uh, algorithm. The objective will will include the purchasing and depletion cost of the bus, the electricity cost, and the labor cost. We consider the four constraints from the network flow, the scheduled bus uh, trips, and the battery SOC or state of charging, and also the recharging. 
those are the three uh, charging scenarios we uh, we proposed in this study. The first one is benchmark scenario. That means the bus will return to the depot and uh, immediately uh, they will link to the, uh, the the charging pile to get charged and they will be fully charged after uh, after each round trip. So in this scenario, uh, there there will be no night charging, uh, 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 nighttime charging, and this is always used in uh, in practice in car, uh, in uh, in the uh, in for the current bus operators of of Nanjing. And the second scenario is night charging scenario. Uh, this is also uh, this is has been widely proposed in many studies because at night the charging fee can be lower and the electricity demand uh, of the city is low. When you charge the bus during this period, actually you are participating in the electricity grid coordination and reduce the energy demand at the, uh, uh, at daytime. So what we want to see if this actually safe charging fees uh, can really help help the operator save money so that we add this scenario into our study. And the last scenario, uh, we call it a uh, flexible charging scenario, and this is based on the optimized charging plan using our optimi uh, optimization. And those are the results. The, these three figures show you the comparison of high, medium to low energy consumption level. And we find that night charging actually have the highest um, operating cost. That, that's mostly from the bus purchasing cost. And for S1 and S2, if we put all of the buses into night charging, actually, um, the total cost will be similar to the uh, to to our optimized one, and we find this is due to the short distance and low energy demand in the selected bus line because this bus line is in the downtown area, and the total co operating cost of S1 and S2 are uh, are the same in this study. We also compare the cost composition from S1 and, and S and S2. You can you can see the bus purchasing has the highest proportion, and for 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 current cases. For the current case, S1 and S2, we have this, we have similar composition of the cost. So here we raise up one question: What if the route is longer? Because this route now it, it is in downtown areas, about four, uh, 24 kilometers uh, per round trip. So if the route is longer or higher end consumption per round trip is required, or uh, like how the night charging can behave uh, can can behave. So we add five additional cases. Uh, we increase the highest level of the energy consumption by 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, until 50%. And now we, uh, we also implement the um, optimization algorithm in those five additional cases, and we want to compare the difference between S1 and S2. And the bottom line shows you the uh, cost from increasing 10% to 40%. And you can see here until 40% S1 or night charging have has the same performance as S2. But when the uh, when the the, uh, the energy consumption or the uh, the distance increased by 50%, you can see S2 or the flexible or the optimal charging has the uh, has lower cost compared to S1. And we also look back to the case five, and we find the uh, this represents the round trip distance is over uh, 46 kilometers, and this will cover most of the urban routes in metro uh, metropolitan areas. So based on our study, if we just coordinate one bus line uh, per time, actually the night uh, nighttime charging is sufficient for us to uh, to reach the cost e effectiveness. And from the scenario comparison, we have the following uh, conclusions. The first one, S1 is suitable when the bus route is short or when the network is small. But S2 will lead to the lower cost when the route has higher energy consumption and longer durations per trip. Uh, regarding the convenience of the operation, we find S1 is more convenient for bus operators to manage. But if we want to uh, implement flexible charging scenario, the real-time communication and coordination are required in practice. And last one, one disadvantage of S1 is that a, lo a large number of charging facilities may be required by S1 because uh, the charging, uh, the charging, the number of charging piles in the depot will be the same as the number of the total uh, bus fleet size. But for S2, it can effectively reduce the size of the bus fleet and it will be, re uh, it will be reducing the total of operation cost. Uh, that's to almost the end of my study. 
Uh, for the contribution part, uh, our study considered the energy uncertainty of buses and uh, optimized with a nonlinear charging function, so it will be uh, more realistic. Uh, we evaluate night charging strategy using varied energy consumption level, and we pro provide uh, recommendations for charging schedules. Uh, as I just mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, uh, this paper was finished last year, and this year we have more interesting results. We expand our network from one line to multiple bus lines. We also consider the limitation of charging facilities in the depot. Uh, besides that, we also extend our algorithm to a, to a network-wide dynamic optimization uh, with a time series prediction, and we will add a life cycle cost of different charging strategies to the overall evaluation of urban bus electrification. And this more, more result has been uh, submitted to, to the TRB this year. So that ends my presentation. Uh, thanks again for having me here, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Ran, for being a time of frames. Uh, I'm looking at the list of the participants, if there is any persons have any questions from the team that ran represent them. Okay, I do have a very short uh, question, Ran. Um, I'm just wondering when you um, proposed a very solid uh, mixed integer linear programming, why you have not reached to the exact solutions? And then you uh, proposed the neighborhood search as well to comprehend it with a MLP. Oh, okay. Because uh, I, I, yeah, we, we tried different, we tried different uh, solutions, uh, like the, the solvers. We tried Ruby, we tried uh, CPEX, and uh, we also tried uh, heuristic algorithm. And we find uh, the gap between the heuristic algorithm and the, the exact solution is very small and uh, and because our uh, our network is kind of like the our uh, the, the service trip is kind of large we have 64 uh, trips per day so that we decide to use here's the algorithm to save our time okay i see thank you so much ran for your presentations i really appreciate it. and thank is you. there any other questions from the audiences okay Thank you so much. We're moving to the next paper. Is perception of the stress among the first train in fully automated vehicle transportation system? It's going to be uh, present by Michelle Spector and also her uh, co authors are Yuram Shifton and Avi Parush. Okay, I'm glad to see Michelle on board. Okay, all yours. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Let's get my slides. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Michelle Spector, I'm a PhD candidate at the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, and today I'm happy to present this uh, research conducted under the supervision of Professor Yoram Shifton, who is also the chair of the Israeli Smart Transportation Research Center. Perceptions of stress among pedestrians in fully automated vehicles. Uh, transportation systems. We are looking at implications for urban design and transportation planning as well as policy. Just that we are all on the same page, uh, we can see that um, I'm looking at the five levels uh, suggested by the Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, we are focusing on level five, meaning it's not just um, feet off, hands off, and eye off, but mind off as well. So um, vehicles that are not backed up by an operator and they're just running on the transportation system um, autonomously. Okay. 
Automated vehicles have many benefits and they are um, predicted to transform our transportation systems. It is implied there will be less accidents because 94% of them are down to human error. So they will increase our safety. They will improve the streamline of traffic. Uh, since there'll be a 60% drop in emissions, full consumption efficiencies will uh, increase and improve air quality as a result. They will solve the first mile and last mile uh, problem. We will, there is a prediction that we'll see a change in car ownership and more uh, demand for mobility on demand. A broader adoption of public transportation and mass in general. And all in all, it will enhance the inclusion and accessibility for um, better quality of life for people with disabilities, as well as those without driving license, such as kids and the elderly. All in all, we hope it will ensure transportation equity and justice. The literature indicates that despite the uncertainty of the future, advanced automated vehicles will be the cars of the future. Pedestrians are key to traffic safety. And so far, transportation research neglected pedestrians' well being. As looking to the research in regards to automated vehicles, current AV research focuses on the users of these vehicles aspects from within the vehicle, such as driving styles. Uh, there is some um, look at vehicle to pedestrian communication, trust, safety, and access acceptability aspects as well. Yet it is acknowledged that successful integration of these vehicles into the transport system depends on understanding also its non-users perceptions. And the literature calls for research bears based on pedestrians' perspective. To summarize this, I, I like this visualization showing that um, fully automated vehicles will allow um, people and community better commute and mobility opportunities. Um, it will require some change into the urban environment in terms of um, policy and design. And we cannot neglect also the fright, uh, not just the transportation of people, but also uh, transport of goods. And uh, we see already on the road some of these um, um, small delivery vehicles. So that has to be taken also into consideration because in many cases they will share the sidewalks uh, with pedestrians. Yet it... Um, comes to a chicken and egg paradox. For pedestrians to feel safe, to trust this new technology, embrace it, and finally adopt it, they need to feel comfortable. They need to feel that the severity level of the stressors in their environment is low. And when we talk about uh, pedestrian emotion, it's not just a cognitive understanding that there are many benefits to automated vehicles, but they need to feel that the severity levels are uh, reduced, and then they will be able to trust the technology, feel more safe, sharing the network with them, and finally embrace it. Moving on to the conceptual model of the research, um, we wanted to check how do pedestrians perceive stress in all fully automated vehicle versus all human-driven vehicle transportation systems with similar activity and special context. So our uh, three main factors are the vehicle type, human-driven or fully automated, special context, whether it's a divided pathway, such as the, there are sidewalks and roads, or shared pathway where there is no clear definition between the designated paths for pedestrians versus those for vehicles, such as on parking lots or plazas. And activity in terms of crossing and not crossing this um, pathway. Of course, also pedestrian characteristics were taken into account, such as walking experience, perception of walk being useful and safe, the global stress score of pedestrians, uh, familiarity with FAVs and uh, the belief will FAV make road safety and social demographics.
giving a snapshot of the different uh, scenarios. We have four scenarios for all human-driven vehicle transport network, um, two in the divided pathway, whether it's not crossing and crossing, and two for the shared pathway, again, not crossing and crossing. Similar scenarios were uh, constructed for the fully automated vehicles. We used uh, virtual reality-based um, video clips. The research was supposed to start just before the outbreak of COVID, and we, we had to adapt our um, measuring tools. So instead of using those virtual reality headsets, we integrated those little short videos into an online uh, survey. Here you can see a snapshot of the videos. The first perspective, um, so the camera is actually the eyes of the As for results, uh, we measured um, agreement disagreement with I would feel stress, and we can see the set of all human driven vehicle scenarios versus the set of all fully automated vehicle scenarios. In both sets, there is an increase of uh, perception of stress as we move across the different scenarios which are a human driven vehicle, divided pathway, no crossing, moving to divided pathway crossing. And then we have shared pathway with no crossing and shared pathway with crossing. And again, this for, for the fully automated vehicle. We did um, have um, the online survey platform distribute the surveys uh, equally. So some were started with the human driven vehicle questions where half of them began with the fully automated vehicle uh, questions. And in each set, those uh, scenarios were randomized. So we mitigated order effects. Moving on to model estimations, uh, the ordinal scales are typically modeled using ordinal regression, also known as the proportional odds method. And we use nonlinear mixed ordinal regression because it uh, assumes some level of within subject dependence. The respondents responded to all eight um, scenarios. The proportional odds assumption is key. It's also known as the test of uh, parallel lines, which is easier to um, show using graphical exploration the, um, the fit of the model. So I will show you some of those. We did a few model estimations. We started with vehicle type. As you can see here, we have the two um, vehicle type available for the research. We have the all human driven vehicle versus the all fully automated vehicle. We check here the probabilities of perceived stress. Now, these are discrete um, figures. But uh, we have these graphs to show that there is here the test of um, parallel lines actually indicated there's no one slope to all um, values. So looking at um, human driven vehicle transport network, um, receiving low stress is right here actually, receiving a stress level number two is the highest for both and seven which is the highest stress level is uh, the lowest in. And for automated vehicles, fully automated vehicles, we see that we have the same sequence of uh, the perceived stress outcome values, but their probabilities of feeling lower stress is lower, whereas the probability for higher stress increases. So here it's just below 0 0.05 and here it's above. 0.05. We did a similar model estimation for spatial context. We have the divided pathways versus the shared pathways. 
here we see a very big um, difference between them. Whereas for divided pathways, the lower stress levels have higher probabilities by far. In the shared pathways, they drop significantly. Whereas the higher probabilities of stress um, are for the higher outcomes as we see here. So we see these crossing lines. For activity, we have not crossing and crossing. Once again, it makes sense when you don't cross the stress levels, the lower stress levels have higher probabilities, whereas when you do cross, uh, the higher stress level increases. Gender had an impact as well. Women perceive higher stress levels, whereas men perceive lower stress levels. That means men have more probability for the low stress, where men, women have higher probabilities for the higher stress levels. And again, we see the crossing lines. There's the indication that the model fits. Impact perception of walking being safe was also a um, uh, variable that fit into the model. We can see here, we have a scale of five and uh, pedestrians uh, rated their perception of walking as safe, meaning one was walking is unsafe, whereas five is very safe. And we can see perception of walking as safe. We have large probabilities for low stress. And when perception of walking is unsafe, those drop significantly. And the perception of um, high stress is orange and turquoise and increases in comparison to very safe. The last um, model actually combines the three main factor interactions. So we have the vehicle type, the um, special context and activity. And these are for each of those eight scenarios, the average probabilities of perceived stress, as we can see. I mean, um, all human driven vehicles, non-crossing divided pathways, the highest is of course, um, low stress perception, but as we move, to different type of vehicles, we see the stress perceptions have a different pattern. This pattern we, we can see also for uh, uh, the impact of combined vehicle type, spatial context activity, gender and perception of walking as safe. I would like to present this in three personas. Persona one is a woman with perception of walking being unsafe. If it's unsafe, we can see a big increase of the probabilities for a uh, high stress level. The orange is the highest stress level rated seven. And if we move to persona two, please uh, pay attention that the access values change, but we can see here the different uh, patterns of the graphs. Women with perception of walking being safe. So may I ask you to quickly wrap the, your presentation because already over 14 minutes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yep. So we have persona two and persona three. Um, we can see how these uh, are comparable. Um, men in general um, uh, report lower stress levels, whereas women report higher stress levels. We can summarize it here in this graph. Stress levels increase in the presence of fully automated vehicles on shared pathways while crossing. Uh, for women and with the perception of walking being unsafe, whereas for um, human-driven vehicle divided pathways not crossing men and perception of walking being safe, the stress levels reported decrease. Thank you very much. Okay, we are just about 15 minutes of the old uh, time is allocated for this presentation for presentation and Q&A. Uh, if there is any Quick questions, we will have a chance to have a one question. Otherwise, we should quickly move to the next uh, paper. 
Okay, I see there is a question in the chat. I'm not quite sure I understand it. Um, uh, Kesawa, do you want to rephrase or if you want it, I can give you access to, to active okay. your... So that um, very ahead, you there. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I was asking in regards to um, the demographics you used during your research. I wanted to know, you know, the older generation, the older, maybe 70, 80, 60, thereabout, in crossing the road, being pedestrians with fully automated vehicles, were they considered during your research? Yes. Um, Initially, we were focusing on three age groups, the young under 18. Um, parents were uh, um, requested to uh, consent on their behalf. And then we had the different age groups as well as the elderly um, 75 plus, but uh, the age didn't fit the model. So probably our we could have improved our data collection. And this is something we'll focus on in future research. Okay, uh, John, if you don't mind, uh, may I ask you to uh, be in contact with the uh, author of this paper offline, and then we quickly move to the next one. Uh, the next paper is explaining artificial neural network based model choice, uh, sorry, uh, neural network based model choice models using Shapley additive explanations. It's going to be presented by Anil uh, Kushik, uh, M. Uh, Manoj and uh, Nizam Nizamuddin. Okay, uh, Anil, are you are you around? Hello. And, yeah. Am I audible? Okay, cool. Uh, you are co-host now, and you can start your presentations. Please stick to the ten minutes presentation, and please give a. Uh, a frame of five minutes for Q&A. Sure, thank you. Go ahead, please. Greetings, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, we can. OK, thank you. Uh, welcome to my presentation, uh, titled uh, Explaining Artificial Neural Network Based Mode Choice Models Using Shapley Additive uh -huh. Explanations. These are the contents and um, uh, machine learning methods are uh, gaining increasing attention mm -hmm. over the recent research uh, uh, years in travel behavior research, especially ANNs have received a lot of attention, but their black box nature continues to evade their practical application. The black box nature refers to the lack of interpretability and explainability of ANN, uh, where uh, there is little understanding of the inner workings of the model or on the variable importance. The black box models inspire less confidence in the results and uh, provide no insights in, into the underlying behavior. A few attempts have been have happened recently to address the black box issue, uh, particularly the one by Alvaro Schiele et al. in 2021, mm -hmm. where they use uh, LRP to understand the variable relevance. In the current study, we use uh, Shapley additive explanations to explain the results of an ANN-based mode choice model. Uh, while the LRP is computationally cheaper, SHAP is model agnostic and SHAP is also seen as a unified measure of attribution by different methods, including LRP. So in, uh, in methods such as, in uh, econometric methods such as uh, logic, the uh, parameters have a meaning by, as, as have been uh, are associated, associated with a meaning by definition, uh, such is not the case, case in ANN where we have to apply yeah, techniques to uh, derive model explanations. Yeah. Hence, the question of trust continues to exist. However, in, uh, in this case, the explanations can be va validated by checking their plausibility uh, based on our intuition and our understanding of the problem. Also, they can be validated by comparison with other established methods. Uh, another thing is uh, ANS struggle with lack of reproducibility. Uh, training the same uh, architecture with the same data repeatedly gives different parameter estimates. So if the sh model explanations given by say SHAP are uh, also, uh, also vary considerably across different runs, then the credibility of the explanations will also come into question. Hence, uh, consistency across different model runs are also need to be tested. 
So the method itself, Shapley additive explanations, has its foundation in game theory, where the contribution of each member in a coalition uh, uh, is of interest, and it is expressed as Shapley values. The idea is same idea is borrowed to neural networks, where the contribution of each variable to an output is expressed as Shapley values. So the Shapley values are uh, enumerated by evaluating the difference caused in the output due to the removal of a particular input variable from the model. Uh, to get the interaction effects also into the into account, this difference need to be valid, uh, evaluated for all those subsets of the input uh, variable set, between which the only difference is the inclusion or exclusion of the particular variable of interest. As the number of input variable increases, this becomes computationally expensive. So to overcome this, Lundberg and Lee propose kernel shafts where the differences are evaluated only on a sample of the subset and a weighted linear regression is used to obtain the actual Shapley values. Uh, approximate uh, Shapley values. So in this, the Sharp method is applied to a mode choice model uh, developed using artificial neural network with dropout regularization. Uh, we use uh, Odin 2019 data set for the city of Rotterdam. The, the model uh, inputs are household and uh, in individual sociodemographic information and trip information such as trip distance, uh, time of departure and so on. The outputs are the probability of uh, each of the alternative uh, of choice for each data point. Uh, the alternatives being a passenger car, public transit, bicycle and walk mode of transport. So SHAP is a local explanatory method, which means SHAP associate, uh, associates each variable with a Shapley value for each data point corresponding to each alternative. Uh, so the meaning of Shapley values can be understood using the force plot for a public transit alternative shown in the figure here. So each, uh, each alternative is associated with a base value, which is its relative frequency in the data set. So the base value can be seen as the probable average probability of that alternative being chosen. And the Shapley values are assigned such that this base value along with all the Shapley values sum up to the output of the model for, for the data point for that alternative. And positive Shapley values indicate that the value of that variable uh, provides evidence that the, the alternative is more likely to be chosen. So positive value for uh, Shapley values push the probability of that variable uh, towards the increases uh, towards the higher side and negative Shapley values push it in the opposite direction. Uh, in this figure, we see that trip distance and weekday are uh, giving an indication that this uh, data point likely corresponds to a public transit alternative, whereas the household car ownership, individual car ownership, and so on are uh, against the, uh, are providing uh, evidence against the public transit as the alternative. Uh, since the overall uh, negative Shapley values outweigh the positive Shapley values, the model outputs a very small probability value for this alternative. Uh, local, uh, local explanations are uh, generally of not much use and global explanations can be obtained by uh, taking average over several data points. And uh, we see that uh, mean Shapley value for uh, passenger car alternative here for several or 300 data points. So we see that trip distance is the variable with the highest mean Shapley value, indicating that it is the most influential variable. Similarly, we see car and individual license ownerships are also uh, also show high mean Shapley values. Moving to public transit, we see that trip distance uh, once again is the variable with the highest influence. We also observe that for, uh, uh, household car, uh, car and individual vehicle ownership, the license ownership uh, also have high mean Shapley values for public transit. So it's important to understand here what Shapley value mean Shapley value means. Uh, a high positive mean Shapley value indicates that the values taken by this variable for in, in each data point has provided the model highest evidence that this is the possible alternative, public transit is the possible alternative. Uh, those values might very well be zero. For example, if the number of cars is zero, the or household has no car ownership, it is more likely to encourage public transit use. So it's very important to understand here that a very high mean Shapley value corresponding to this does not indicate that as the number of car increases, public transit is more likely to be chosen. So that's the takeaway from here. And similar explanation can be provided here for, for, for example, for trip distance for walk mode, uh, a high mean Shapley value does not indicate that as trip incre uh, distance increases, walk is more likely to be chosen. Instead, it indicates that the values of trip distance, very likely uh, very small trip distance values, are provided the model evidence that walk is the possibly uh, high uh, 
probably the likelier uh, mode of choice. Uh, and we see that uh, 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 part-time workers uh, and uh, homemakers have high Shapri values for the bicycle mode. And uh, recreation activities, pur uh, recreation purpose trips, uh, social visit trips, personal care trips, these all have also high sh Shapri values for walk. So it, it might be more uh, insightful to see, uh, to study misclassified cases in detail. It will provide as insights that might help improve the model. Here we see the misclass uh, mean Shapley values provided for the when the for the cases where the predicted uh, choice is passenger car, but they observed or actual choices walk. Uh, the positive trip distance for the correct uh, alternative and the negative trip distance uh, Shapley value for the wrong alternative here indicates that the model is not confused between these two modes because of the trip distance uh, variable. Instead, when we see here the number of cars uh, have a high positive mean Shapley value for the uh, passenger car, which is the wrong alternative, and very, uh, high negative Shapley value for the correct alternative, which indicates that the car, the model is probably confused between these two because of these variables. That means this probably indicates that the model wrongly classified the walking trips done by individuals belonging to households with high car ownership. Similar insights can be obtained, but I'll I'll move further considering the time constraints. Uh, again, another uh, study where um, uh, in detail we see uh, observed uh, uh, mode is passenger car and the predicted mode is walk. And here we see the high negative trip distance value for the uh, correct alternative and high positive for the wrong alternative indicates that the model was confused between uh, these two because of the trip distance. So this indicates the mo model probably predicted small short distance uh, passenger car trips as uh, walk mode trips. So in summary, the model seems to distinguish between uh, mainly using uh, trip distance uh, with long distance trips uh, associated with car and public transit and short distance trips associated with bicycle and walk modes. And it also uses the next model uses vehicle and license ownerships bit to distinguish between car and public transit modes and the bicycle and walk modes are distinguished using trip purpose and social participation of the individual. Uh, similar insights can be obtained by studying in detail, but uh, we will not discuss those here. So next we study the consistency of sharp explanations uh, uh, across 10 model runs. So uh, the the mean sharp value column provides the mean of mean Shapley value across 10 model runs and the standard, this provides the standard deviation of uh, mean Shapley values across 10 model runs. Uh, it's important to understand here that the, uh, the variation or randomness in the Shapley explanations come uh, because of two reasons. One is because of the lack, uh, because of the inconsistency in neural network parameter estimates. And second is because uh, these mean, Sha mean Shapley values are uh, calculated over a sample mean only. So that sample varies across, uh, if the sample varies across 10 model runs, then the variation could come because of that as well. So if we fix the sample points over which the mean Shapley values are computed and ensure that the uh, variation is because of only the inconsistency in the neural network estimates, we see that the variation in Shapley values uh, are considerably small. So next, uh, it, the idea of this uh, table is to uh, check whether the variables which have high, which are shown as very influential by the SHAP explanations, whether they also turn up as significant in some established methods such as multinomial logic. So we trained a multinomial logic using the same data. And uh, we see that uh, at least some of the top few uh, variables shown as highly influential by the SHAP explanation also turn up significant in beta estimates. Uh, the idea clearly is here is not to compare the mean SHAP values with the beta estimates as they carry completely different meanings. Uh, in conclusion, the study tries to address the black box issue of ANNs. Uh, based uh, travel demand or uh, travel behavior models by using SHAP method. Uh, Shapley explanations were found to be uh, plausible and consistent across different model runs, and they were found to be in reasonable agreement with MNL results. So in future studies, may look into uh, studying the SHAP values in association with the corresponding values taken by the variable. This will give us an insight into uh, what the nature of influence, which variable is positively influencing and choice alternative or which variable is negatively influenced. That insight might be useful. So future studies may look into that. Uh, these are my references. And um, thank you for listening. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to. Okay. Thanks, Anil. Uh, 12 minutes for presentations. Good enough. Uh, is there any question from Anil?
Uh, I do have a very quick question. I know uh, when you're using a deep learning that you uh, uh, adopted the Shopley uh, techniques in your uh, method, uh, are you still, I'm just, it's a very general question. Is still, do you have any uh, interpretable uh, outcomes out of uh, uh, ANN model or you're only aiming for a higher accuracy? No, this is an interpretable outcome. This uh, actually, these show which variables influence the model results. So these are explainable. Uh, this explains the model results. Not really interpretable, but it becomes explainable. The shaft value aims to explain the model decisions. So we get insights. Okay, understand. These okay. do not increase the accuracy at all. It's not. Okay. Means and, and if, if you drop some of those variables from the list, did you try that you the, your outcome would be better or doesn't any change expectations? Uh, we did not, but uh, yeah, that seems like a nice uh, study. Thank you. Okay, cool. Really? Now I'm just comparing my mind between the classical models that yes. is much more uh, enhanced and also interpretable, but we did a great right. job. Thank you so much. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Okay, thank you so much, Anul, and thank your you. other, your other uh, colleagues. Uh, we're moving to the last two uh, papers. The, the next one uh, title is Challenges and Opportunity for, of Agent-Based Models in Urban Transportation Research. A systematic literature review using bibliometrics and content analysis. Uh, has been written by Faza, uh, Fauzan, uh, Bastarinato, um, uh, Charisma Chundri, uh, Ed Mandley, and Thomas Hancock. And uh, Thomas is on board. Oh, Fa do you want to present Faza? Yeah, I will be presenting the. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Uh, you are now uh, a co-host. Okay, let me stop. Anil, do you mind to stop your uh, slides? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it done? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, can everybody see my slides now? Yep. Go ahead, please. You have a ten minutes from now. Okay. Okay. Hi, hi everyone. I am Faisal from University of Leeds. Uh, I will be presenting our working paper. Uh, it's about a systematic a literature review using bibliometric and content analysis in exploring challenges and opportunities of agent-based models in urban transportation research. This is what I'm going to present. First is the background of the study. Second is aims of the study. Then methodology. Next findings from the analysis. Lastly, some points regarding challenges and direction for future research will be presented. As we can see in our, in our surroundings, the emerging transportation system is composed of complex large-scale interactions that are generated by the travelers' behavior as they engage with their dynamic environment. This dynamic environment consists of transport infrastructures, modes, services, and technologies. Furthermore, the traveler's spatial and socioeconomic characteristics are also considered as aspects in a dynamic environment. Since this environment influences people's mobility in a complex interaction, the travelers have to make complex decision making for their trip or activity. To understand those behavior of people's mobility, researchers and planners in transport really on transportation forecasting models. Over half of the century, two distinct approaches of travel demand modeling have emerged, such as trip-based and activity-based approach. However, in the last decade, the agent-based system has emerged as a method to model the complexity of the transportation system. 
originating in the area of computing. Agent-based model is adaptable and capable to model individual with their own set of distinct characteristics and rules of behavior. This application of these models can now be uh, discovered in a variety of different fields, including in the transport research, such as traffic modeling, logistics, emission modeling, pedestrian behavior, parking, evacuation, as well as uh, emerging mobility. Based on wide ranging growing literature, uh, the agent-based model is extensively used uh, within urban areas. However, to date, uh, very few studies have been done in exploring the contribution of agent-based models within urban transportation domain in a wide ranging literature approach. Therefore, uh, this review has three goals. First is examining how researchers have employed the agent-based models in the field of urban transport research by using bibliometric technique and content analysis. This enables the researchers to investigate the current development of agent-based models while also shedding light on the emerging areas in the urban transport domain, which will be the second goal in the study. Then, this paper is expected to contribute to the body of work by reporting the challenges and suggesting future uh, research work opportunities by identifying the current gaps of their applications in the urban transport field. Here, I would like to show the methodological steps used in the study. There are four steps employed in the study. Uh, the first stage is collecting the data. The second step is data analysis, which consists of uh, bibliometric analysis uh, and content analysis. Bibliometric tools used in the study are Fosfewer and Bibliosigny. The results from bibliometric analysis is then visualized to see the uh, timeline of produced articles, geographical distributions, Sankey diagrams, and research clustering. Lastly, the output from content analysis will be used to identify challenges and formulate the opportunities for future research. The literature data used in this research were collected from the Scopus Index database. The search for relevant literature in urban transport involved sorting through a large number of articles by using uh, the main topic keyword, agent-based, uh, followed by predetermined 50, 52 keywords so, as shown in the table. The chosen criteria, as you can see here, were determined based on general main topics used from previous extensive studies on agent-based model in urban transport. Um, the results from selection criteria is not a final data set. So this can be done by, uh, the, the final data set, data set can be done by doing a refinement process to exclude documents that are relevant to agent-based uh, in urban transport. The data refinement process is based on Prisma guidelines um, from, from about 1,144 documents identified in the first stage of retrieving data. It was turned to be 300 documents in the final data, which represents the largest data set for this type of analysis on agent-based model. Once having a, refine, a refinement data set of literatures, the bibliometric analysis and content analysis can be employed. Here I am going to describe the results starting with the final data set of literatures. What you see here in the left set is the detail of the results of refinement process, whereas the right set shows the annual production of publication related to IBM in urban transport. It was shown that the annual production was identified from 2006 and the growth of the publication is exponential starting from around 2015 to date. Move on to the next result is the trend usage of the top 10 modeling tools in the ABM studies. The results from this illustration reveal that Massim is the most popular agent-based simulation framework used in this context. The second most frequently used agent-based tool is NetLogo. This research also took into consideration the country where the case study has been undertaken which may be different uh, from the country of author's affiliation. As you can see here, the geographical distribution of papers based on case studies is concentrated um, in developed countries such as Germany, US, Switzerland, and Singapore. In contrast, models are rarely 
uh, applied in the context of uh, developing country in the global in the global south, where countries have different characteristics of travel behavior and may require different approach. Further, the relationship among agent-based framework case studies and others can be seen in this three field uh, plot diagram. The diagram highlights that the central agent-based frameworks are Maxim and NetLogo, with Germany, Switzerland, and Singapore among the top countries where the studies have been conducted. Here is the results from the co-occurrence analysis using FOSVIWA. Um, there are nine clusters identified from co-occurrence analysis. And the content analysis has been employed for each cluster to and explore whether there are any challenges uh, and opportunities that can be elaborated. This figure, this figure shows the historical trends of agent-based model in urban transport field based on publication year. Uh, we, we can see here that uh, dynamic traffic assignment and transport measure related to congestion pricing uh, are the dominant categories from 2016 to 2017, and then uh, they become less influential in the 2020s. Meanwhile, emerging transport technologies trends such as red sharing, DRT, and uh, electric vehicle ap appeared in the period uh, 2017 to 2019 and received more attention from researchers in the 2020s to date. So uh, based on the content analysis, there are six points of challenges that need to be addressed by future researchers. First is improving computing efficiency. This study confirmed that when a large number of agents are simulated, uh, the model environment becomes more complex. This requires an increase in computational resource to improve model uh, performance, capturing complex interaction. Therefore, improving the computing efficiency in large-scale agent-based models will continue to be a motivation in the future as the transport system in the future becomes more complex. Second is the need to have unified calibration and validation procedures. There is no uh, unified conceptual framework that can be implemented properly and securely for calibration and valid validation process as application of agent-based model in transport is uh, diverse across different problem levels. Thus, uh, a calibration of validation methods such as comparing the findings with analytical models can be explored further to increase the credibility of the agent-based uh, model's results. Third is uh, regarding uh, reproducibility of work. As one of the most recently developed methods, agent-based models in transport system require extensive exploration by many researchers. However, the, research, the researchers in this area face difficulties even to produce simulations since previous models are rarely replicable due to uh, confidential, confidential data and tools, for instance. So a sort of streamlined process for the simulations should be standardized. Therefore, this initiative, this initiative will presumably allow uh, reproducibility of agent-based transport simulation by any researchers. Next point is embedding uh, various models of frameworks in, in the model. Uh, exploring a variety of model frameworks to be embedded in agent-based toolkit is essential to work closely with real-world individual behavioral and traffic system. Next will be next challenge will be analyzing the transport complex system in affecting travel behavior and travel demand. Transport systems are becoming more complex as it faces various emerging transport modes and mobility seems such as electric vehicle, DRT, red sharing, even urban air mobility. Therefore, investigating um, the impact of this complex system to existing transport environments, to, to existing transport environments are crucial. The last challenge is related to equity concern of study location. The study on agent-based transport simulation in urban areas are unevenly distributed across a geographical space. Uh, the case studies are mostly conducted in developed economics rather than developing economies. Uh, the potential challenge would be socio-demographic structure, travel patterns, and available transport modes that are substantially different. Therefore, it is crucial to see the influence of these various characteristics in uh, agent-based model uh, approach. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. So if any one of you have any question, please simply ask and I'll be happy to answer. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, 
again a bit over the uh, 10 minutes, but that's okay. We will have plenty of time to finish on time for the uh, last papers. Uh, if there is any quick questions, please. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, your next one. Uh, from the piece uh, paper, if there is any questions, could you please go ahead? Uh, I do have a very quick question uh, that um, I'm just wondering what types of the pre-processing on the data that you collected from uh, Scopus have you applied before getting rushing to the, you know, producing some uh, complex network and some visualizable results. So yeah, um, uh, in terms of data preparation, uh, uh, data getting... cleaning, data cleaning, because you know, in a, oh, okay. some of the names are abbreviated or is slightly changed from different sources, but are, are the same. I'm, I'm just wondering in terms of the data fusion somehow, how did you come up with your final pool? I'm sorry, could you please repeat that question? Well, I'm, I'm just uh, asking how did, what types of uh, pre-processing have you applied in the data that you collected from Escobos? Okay, so yeah, um, this, this um, uh, we, we call it a refinement process. So there, there are two steps here, um, identification, screening, and then we can get the final data set of literature research. And in, in the screening process, there are two uh, imp important steps. The first one is data cleaning, including eliminating unrelated keywords and also filtering only English papers. And from mm -hmm. these steps, uh, we can reduce from 1,144 uh, documents to 769 documents. Then the second uh, data cleaning process so the, the, the second data screening process is data refinement by reading the abstract of each articles. So from, from this um, process, I uh, remove around 66 documents that are uh, irrelevant to, to this uh, agent-based model in urban transport uh, studies. Okay, okay, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, we're moving to the last paper. The title is a strategies to reduce car use in Singapore, a behavioral science approach. Uh, yeah. Can Juan NG is here? You are now co-host and you can share your slides. Uh, before we uh, moving to the last paper, if you don't mind, I would like to ask you at the end of the, this session, we will get a, a gathering photo. Just everybody that if you want to prepare the, the webcam and then we'll have a, a nice gathering photo as a memory of these sessions that we do have in two hours before. Okay, uh, you have a, a 10 minutes, go ahead, please. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes, yep. you can go ahead, please. Okay, uh, so good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone, depending on where you are attending this conference from. Uh, my name is Kai Shen, and on behalf of my team of authors, who are some of them are also present in today's session, I will be presenting our study titled Strategies to Reduce Car Use in Singapore, a Behavioral Science Approach. So if you find some of these names familiar, it's because we are part of the same team as Mr. Yuan, soon to be Dr. Yuan, who presented the piece on perceived accessibility earlier on in this session. Uh, before I begin, I would also like to state that there is a slight iteration to our slides compared to the one previously submitted to the BTR team. So perhaps I could get in touch with the moderators after this session to update the slides. Okay. Uh, now, despite a brief respite of traffic congestion due to the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdowns, traffic congestion is once again on the rise in many countries around the world. And in some locations, car use may have even exceeded pre-pandemic levels. And additionally, from our survey conducted in December last year, we employed the stage assessment model by STEC to ask car drivers to self-categorize how much they are willing to give up car use. In this survey, we found that a good proportion of drivers who stated at least some intention to replace driving trips with other modes. 
So this suggests that there might be some interest in a nudge program that seeks to accelerate the transition out of car dependence, especially from those who classify themselves as either in stages three and four, which constitutes about 40% of car owners. Now, existing literature has revealed that uh, financial incentives tend to be well received and are generally perceived to be more effective compared to other behavioral interventions. And it is also widely acknowledged that financial incentives can serve as a lever to shift travel modes. A recent study based on self-evaluation and reporting among university students in Brazil revealed that the provision of financial incentives compared with other behavioral incentives interventions to promote sustainable travel was overall the most accepted strategy in terms of being most well-liked, having the highest intention to use as well as being perceived as most effective. We also observe a similar result from the same survey we conducted last December as seen on the graph here, uh, in which car owners rated financial savings as the strategy that they think would be most effective in increasing their public transport usage. Now, while the use of financial incentives to encourage the use of public transport has been discussed extensively in transportation literature, uh, findings on the effectiveness and persistence of such incentives have been mixed. So as behavioral sciences have identified several other approaches to incentive design that may produce larger effect sizes and larger persistence effects, much is still uh, very context dependent. Uh, more specifically, our study leverages on behavioral nudges in the context of a hypothetical policy objective for car users to go car light. Compared to incentive programs that conventionally offer only one type of incentive design, one key feature of our proposed car-free program is to allow participants to choose their preferred behavioral strategy out of a menu of incentive delivery designs, which they will then use for the entire duration of the program. Essentially, we are giving the participants more ownership of their, of their choice of design, and we relieve the program designer of having to identify a quote-unquote winning winning intervention for a target population. So within the context of offering drivers a car-free program that aids their transition into a car light lifestyle, our study objectives are as follow. Uh, firstly, we aim to investigate the relative popularity of the five incentive designs that we will be presenting to our participants in the menu of designs. And secondly, to study if giving participants full autonomy in choosing their incentive design would garner more participation than giving participants no autonomy by pre-selecting an incentive design for the hypothetical car-free program. So <clears throat> moving on to our methodology, we recruited a total of 115 drivers from a government agency in Singapore. With these 115 respondents, we randomized them into two further conditions. On the left, we see that 58 respondents were piped into the full autonomy condition, right? Um, where participants are shown a menu of incentive designs to, show, uh, to choose from. Here, we will also attempt to obtain the relative popularity and participant rates of strategies. On the right, we see that 57 respondents were piped into the no autonomy condition, where we imposed a single incentive design on participants. Based on which design had the highest relative popularity among all incentive designs in the full autonomy condition, we chose and imposed it for the participants with the no autonomy condition. Now, in this slide, we see the exact image that the participants saw for the menu of incentive designs under the full autonomy condition. These incentive delivery mechanisms are in the context of a hypothetical policy objective for car users to achieve at least eight car-free days within uh, over a 28-day period, with the reward expenditure for a participant kept constant at $20 across all strategies for the same objective, it would be possible to evaluate the effect of incentive design on behavior beyond the obvious impact of incentive magnitude on behavior. There are a total of five incentive designs for a hypothetical program. First, aim high, which requires drivers to go car-free in a streak of eight consecutive days. As this design may be particularly difficult for some car drivers to accomplish, they are also given one extra life to recover from a broken streak without having to reset the streak. Secondly, enticingly close, where drivers received a post-dated check uh, with the program incentive. 
the check will remain valid if drivers complete at least eight car-free days within a month. And this is also the strategy with the highest relative popularity among the respondents from the full autonomy condition, which is hence the single incentive design shown to drivers under the no autonomy condition. The third incentive design we have is four in a row, which drivers re re which requires drivers to complete two streaks of four consecutive car-free days each. Fourth, skin in the game where drivers will first deposit $10 into a fund, and upon completion of at least eight car-free days within the month, they will be given back their deposit as well as the program incentive. And last but not least, temptation bundling, which is a technique where drivers pick an indulgence such as Netflix, uh, ebooks, or even mobile games to enjoy only while they are on public transport. Likewise, the goal for this incentive design is for drivers to complete eight car-free days in total before they can receive the financial incentive as a form of reimbursement for the purchase of their indulgence. Moving on to the findings, here we see the relative popularity of the incentive design shown to participants under the full autonomy condition. As we can see here, the most popular design out of the five is enticingly close, with about 38% of our participants selecting this design as their preferred program format. Uh, the second most popular design is four in a row, uh, with 16% of our respondents choosing this as their preferred design. And this is followed by Temptation Bundling. And last but not least, Aim High and Skin in the Game were the least popular incentive designs among the five. And this could be because Aim High is rather difficult for participants to follow through as it requires eight consecutive car-free days. And for Skin in the Game, perhaps the idea of deposit contracting could just be unpopular among our participants. Now, uh, we looked at the state stated participation rates uh, as well of the hypothetical program among the drivers within the full autonomy and no autonomy condition. Here, we start out by first asking the participants in both conditions, right, if they will be interested in a program that aims to aid drivers who intend to give up their cars to adopt a car light and eventually car-free lifestyle. For this question, there was no mention of the fin any financial incentive or behavioral designs. We then progressively introduced additional aspects into the program to see if there are any changes in the stated participation participation rate. So in the first question, where we only asked them about their interest in the program alone, the numbers here looked fairly comparable across both conditions, uh, with about slightly more than half of our respondents stating that they are interested in the program. Then for those who stated that they would not be interested in the program only, uh, they were then asked if they would be interested in the program again, but this time there will be a financial incentive of $20. Uh, here we can see that the total participation rate uh, increased by about 3%. Uh, for participants under the full autonomy condition, while the particip participation rate remained the same for participants under the no autonomy condition. Thus, it seems like the introduction of the $20 cash incentive alone did not sway participants who initially did not choose to participate in the program by much. Now, following which participants were then shown the behavioral designs, as shown earlier, drivers under the full autonomy condition were shown the menu of incentive designs and drivers under the no autonomy condition were shown a single incentive design, which is more specifically enticingly close. For drivers under the full autonomy condition, we observed by giving them uh, a menu of incentive designs to choose from, their stated participation rate increased by 17 percentage points to about 75% participation rate. And this increase is statistically significant uh, from the 58% in the program only question. And on the other hand, for drivers under the no autonomy condition, by imposing a single incentive design, we observe a seven percentage points decrease in the stated participation rate compared to the question with a program and a financial incentive. Now, overall, we observe that by introducing the behavioral designs, the stated participation rate between the full autonomy and no autonomy conditions was statistically significantly different with the full autonomy condition revealing a higher stated participation rate. Now, this goes to show that the introduction of a menu of incentive design could lead to higher participation rates as compared to imposing a single incentive design. And this heightened interest could in turn heighten the effectiveness of a program. Now, moving on to the perception of the incentive design, we asked all participants the following question, right? How much do you like the program format where they could answer basically based on a seven point Likert scale with one being I don't like it at all and seven being I really like it. So overall participants who chose one of the five program formats uh, scored an average of 5.07, suggesting that most of them like their chosen program format. Now, if we zoom into enticingly close program format and compare the scores for the two conditions, we observe that the participants in the full autonomy condition scored an average of 5.23 out of seven, 
which is higher than the average score of 4.89 for the participants under the no autonomy condition. Admittedly, we understand that the numbers are underpowered and that we observe no statistical differences between them, but, di but directionally, the numbers seem to point in a direction that suggests that providing a menu of incentive designs could be more attractive than imposing a single incentive design. And as an extension to this study, researchers could seek to expand the sample size by repeating this experiment and potentially establishing an effect. Now, in conclusion, as a menu format is highly adaptable, our findings suggest that exploring this format beyond the context of going car free could be fruitful as increased particip participation could potentially translate to increased effectiveness. And additionally, they may, this may extend well beyond the topic of land transport into other forms of transport or even beyond transport, such as in the topic of healthcare. However, we should strike a balance between the provision of too little versus too many options, as having too many options could lead to choice paralysis. And in this aspect, perhaps a very natural question to ask is then how much is too much? And what is the threshold, if any, that we are here able to tolerate? And further studies could also seek to understand the mechanisms behind the choice of incentive design and who are more likely to choose what kinds of incentive designs. Some of these moderators of choice could include demographics or even stages of change, as I've mentioned earlier in this presentation. Now, with that, uh, that is the end of the presentation. And I would like to hear your thoughts uh, if you have any. And alternatively, you may write to the following email address uh, should you have further queries about our study. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation and also managing the times. Uh, you just a bit over the time, so I'm looking at the list. If there is any question from uh, Kia Jun, um, I'm happy to take. Otherwise, we're going to wrap the session on time. Uh, Kia Jun, it was a really good uh, presentation. I really appreciate it. You, you speak very fast to cover all the slides. And then, yeah, I'm happy that you um, propose an incentive-based uh, policy changing study in Singapore. Um, okay, um, if uh, we, we're going to uh, getting a gathering photo. Uh, if anybody in the uh, room likes to, Turn on your, yep, yeah, put it in the gallery, yeah, to have everybody up on board. We're hoping to starting the, taking a click soon. Does anybody want to join us? Okay. One, two, three, biggest minds. Okay, I'm trying to send it through here if I could. Doesn't allow us to send the photo. Anyway, I would like them to thank My everybody. No, that's okay. I'm really <laughs> appreciate everybody. And also it was really insightful presentations. Uh, we just four minutes over the time. I believe uh, you all you did a very good job. I really appreciate all of the presentation and also all your colleagues involved in your papers. No, so yeah. It's end of the, this session. And if you have nothing to say, I'm um, wishing you all the best and also safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.